All right, go up on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We're, we are very happy to have you here today. It is with great pleasure to welcome you to the Nisi Conference 2021. We are gathered here today and tomorrow to reimagine the future of citizenship education in Europe. Wherever it is that you are tuning in from, be it virtually or right here from Les Ateliers de Tanneur in Brussels, be it as the 18-year tradition or for the very first time, we are thrilled to spend these next two days with you to discuss Committed to Change. My name is Yolanda Roter. And I'm Victor Vlam. Uh, it, it's very much our honor to have you here today. Uh, Yolanda, do you remember last year's title of the conference? It was called uh, A Post-Pandemic World, ladies and gentlemen, because we fully expected to be in a post-pandemic world. And that was, unfortunately, just slightly too optimistic. <laughs> we are not entirely there yet. Uh, and that means that this is a so-called hybrid event. We have about 100 people here here, but there are also about 500 people joining us through other means. We have uh, the plenary session, which are all streamed at the website nisi.eu, and then we have a lot of parallel sessions tomorrow, which are going to be streamed via Zoom and Gather Town, and we're going to have a networking space on Gather Town as well. Uh, that is something you can still sign up for, so if you're watching this on the nisi.eu website and you haven't signed up for Gather Town, please do so. Now there are a couple of spots left, so nisi.eu. EU, and that's where you can find all the information to sign up. Exactly. There's also a hashtag that we would encourage you to use as you share that you're a part of this conference. The hashtag is hashtag Nisi2021. We're so curious to learn over these next two days about citizenship education and also to learn from you. And this is why we want to start right away with an audience interaction via slido.com. On this, we want to learn where it is that you are joining us from today. So you can just go to slido.com, type in the six digit code, or use the QR code. We all I'm know sure. how to use QR codes these <laughs> exactly. days, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and um, type in the country that you're um, joining us here from. We already have two countries, Georgia and my very own home country, yes. Germany. My home country, the Netherlands, is not up here yet, but I will assume that that is just a matter of time. Yes. So Again, slido.com, and the code is 218315. Belgium, we have Belgium up here. That must have been a long way to travel for you guys. <laughs> Who's from Belgium? Can people from Belgium raise? Yes, there we go. Oh, a lot of people from Belgium, wonderful. We're very happy to have you, of course, here. We have Germany as one of the larger ones. Who here in the room is from Germany? I see a few hands, oh, okay. Oh, wow, lots of Germans here in the room. Amazing. The Netherlands is growing, yes, that's Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, Austria. We have Brazil in the house. That's amazing. Welcome. That's Brazil. kind of amazing to have Brazil here as well. That's, yeah. that's one of the nice things about one of these hybrid events. You have a lot of people from all over the world, essentially. Amazing. I think that this gives us a really great insight. And as this list keeps growing, I would just love to give you an insight on what is expecting all of us here over the next two days. So today, there's going to be theoretical input. We're going to have a panel hosted by Victor on Let's Talk Future. There will be a keynote conversation later on today that I'll be hosting, and I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. There's going to be quite a few opportunities to network as well in between with so-called Brussels to Windows and the open space. Tomorrow, it will be more interactive. There are field trips that are happening in person, and there's one very central information. For everyone who is planning on joining these field trips, you must register here in person at the registration up front um, to let us know exactly which field trips you are um, planning on joining. There will also be a few virtual field trips. You can find out more about that online. And there will be parallel sessions via Zoom 
and exactly. gather town. Some interesting things that are going to be happening tomorrow. Can we see the final tally for the uh, which countries people are from, perhaps? Is that possible? Or there's a lot of... <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, yes, there we go. Wonderful. Okay, so the, all of these countries are... Um, represented here today with uh, a big German delegation, as we just saw here. Uh, that's that's a good thing. I, I absolutely love Germans. It's probably a good thing for us to say we love Germans. Now. <laughs> but we have Japan in the house. We, we have do Croatia have Japan. here, Sweden even. So it's really wonderful. And hello to everyone tuning in. Great. We want to make it as interactive as possible. <laughs> and one of the ways to make it as interactive as possible... Oh, oh Luxembourg is growing. Oh, wow, <laughs> this is happening as I'm talking. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, uh, we want to make it as interactive as possible, ladies and gentlemen. That's why we also have a Telegram channel. Um, Yolanda, are you as addicted to your phone as I am? I'd rather not answer. You are being very polite. Thank you very much. No, I, I, tend to, I do tend to be a little bit addicted to my phone. In this case, that's a good thing, because we have a Telegram channel where you can actually communicate with each other. There are currently 35 members. There is a link link on uh, the online access page, and we're giving you some uh, uh, behind-the-scenes pictures. I think even some people have shown us some pictures of their uh, flight coming into us here. We can perhaps exchange some gossip here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just to entice you to go to the Telegram group, and which might be fun. Some people are joining us from literally their backyard. So if you are joining us online, show us a picture of how you are um, enjoying the conference, and share that on Telegram to make it as interactive as possible. All right, that is the introduction. And now it is our absolute pleasure to welcome on stage Fatih Dermijan, who is the program manager and NISI coordination for the Federal Agency for Citizenship Education in Germany, and Anne Lavens, the, direct, the director from Bellevue Museum right here in Brussels and a NISI partner. Fatih and Anne, the stage is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Yolanda and uh, Victor, and a uh, warm welcome to all of you here in Brussels and also for all our virtually um, participants. My name is Fatih Demirjan. I'm, uh, I'm the project, project manager of NISI at the Federal Agency for Civic Education. Committed to Change, Reimagining the Future of Citizenship Education in Europe is the title of our hybrid NISI conference 2021. But why reimagining? The COVID pandemic has forced us to break new ground. We were not prepared for this. For 18 months, all of us have tried and dared, rejected and learned. But one thing is certain. These new spaces will not disappear. Now is the time to learn the lessons and to create a new future for citizenship education together. And while we are at it, why don't we open up more new spaces where, for example, diversity is not just a wake aspect, but is, is reflected in our own very, uh, very own daily working structure. Spaces that welcome people who are passionate about citizenship education on the ground, not just people with university degrees. Even when it comes to human-induced climate change, the approaches taken so far are simply not sufficient. We have to think out of the box. I'm sure today's talk with Bonaventuren de Kunk at 6 p.m. will provide food for thought. Over the next two days, we have workshops, panels, talks, open spaces planned for you here in Brussels and all our virtual participants as well. Please stay tuned and enrich our conference. Before I hand over to our next speaker, I would like to take the opportunity to thank my entire team for preparing this hybrid conference. First, thank you to my BPB team and thank you to Lab Concepts. What an amazing organization. Thank you very much. A special thank you goes to Petra Grüne. Without you, there would be neither this conference nor this network. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank the entire NISI advisory board and all its partners. A special thanks 
to Anne Lavins and her team from Bellevue for their ongoing support and encouragement. Thank you very much, Anne. I wish you all of, I wish all of us two enriching and enjoyable days, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Fatih. Um, I'm very pleased to open this conference today in Brussels, the home of the Bellevue, but also the beating heart of Europe. Once again, it wasn't easy to put a conference together due to the ever-changing measures resulting from the COVID pandemic. Gave us some headaches sometimes. Uh, but we have tried to create a program as interesting as possible for both the participants here in Brussels and those following the conference online. The future of citizenship, democracy and society and the role that citizenship education can play therein. Very pertinent questions that occupy us all daily in our work. How can we best address the challenges and strive to tackle inequality, encourage inclusion and participation and pursue sustainability? Especially after a period like this, when the divides have deepened and populism and polarization have gained ground. Together with you all, I'm looking forward to learn from, to be challenged and be inspired by all the beautiful projects, tools, debates, workshops and conversations in this conference in order to work together and with renewed energy for a society that is just, equal and sustainable. Thank you all, thank you all for making this happen. Thank you Lab Concepts, thank you BPB, thank you for being here. Let's enjoy this conference, thank you. So now, I would like to say hello to Sheila. Great to have you with us again. How was your workshop? Thank you very much. Um, We're happy to be here. Our workshop actually is tomorrow. Our satellite workshop will be tomorrow. And we shall be reflecting on the future of citizenship education, but focusing on gender equality in the face of COVID and what the role of civic education is for the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we would like to uh, speak to Tativik. Tativik, can you hear and see me? Yes, can you hear and see me? Perfectly. Um, first of all, where are you sitting at the moment right now? Oh, I'm in Armenia actually, uh, in a nice place uh, with a hot tea beside me and uh, enjoying uh, the conference welcome, which was really warm. And I would like to uh, also to take the pride and uh, greet everyone on behalf of Eastern European Network for Citizenship Education. It is lovely to see that uh, at last we have made the progress on uh, hybrid format for NEC, and hopefully everyone will have an enlightening conference with great insights, research, and nice information together and take with us to do work in our respective countries until we meet again together in person, offline, healthy and safe. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Tativik. I, I hope that will happen very, very soon. Uh, Anne, I think it's your turn. Merhaba, Moes. Where are you right now? Nice to see you, and uh, even if I'm online and in, not in person, because I really miss all my friends that I have been meeting for the last years, attending the NISI conference. Uh, now I'm in Tunisia, uh, profiting from the last sunny days before it gets, uh, we get the bad weather. But uh, it's, uh, it's amazing and uh, to be with you, and uh, particularly that we, uh, I'm, I'm going to reflect on the, 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 the satellite workshop we got on the 22nd of October with a lot of uh, stakeholders from different backgrounds, from security, from the Minister of Education, from civil society, either local or international organization. And it was a very challenging workshop because a lot of issues have been raised, a lot of challenges, particularly with, after the, co with the COVID. And I, I, I wish I could say after the COVID because it's still going on and hopefully we will, everybody will be safe. And uh, particularly with the increase of populism, of violence, 
and the impact of COVID on our societies with the increase of uh, uh, the violence, particularly against women and uh, children. So there is a lot of challenges. We have we had a lot of question, questions raised, and we have also a lot of recommendations that we'll be sending, sharing with you, hopefully very soon. Okay, thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, we have Dobrina. Dobrina, can you hear and see me? Yes, I can. Hi, and uh, hi everyone. It is a it is a pleasure to be with you, even though virtually. Yeah, um, I'm joining from Sofia, Bulgaria. So how, go ahead. How wonderful to have you here. Uh, you already conducted the workshop, right? Can you tell us about the workshop a little? Yes, yes, we did. Uh, we hold uh, we held the workshop on the 26th. Um, we talked about uh, youth participation, um, civic participation uh, with uh, students between 12 and 18 years um, old. Um, we discussed the findings of the Civic Health Index Bulgaria, which is a very new innovative tool to measure um, the state of democracy and civic participation. The pilot run was done in Bulgaria here, and we have very exciting findings uh, related to um, youth, youth participation in civil society and democracy. So the workshop was dealing with that topic, and we discussed possibles, possible implications of the findings. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have the possibility to read about the workshops uh, after the conference, so just go on nisi.eu and then you will find all the information about the workshops as well. And uh, thank you uh, again for being here with us today and thank you for, for being with us all around the world, virtually, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And on. It is now time to get started with the meat of the matter to the actual program. And uh, during today's uh, first uh, session day, we're going to have a uh, couple of opportunities to meet some of the local organizations from Brussels to see exactly what they're doing, what they are made up of. And we're going to call those sessions the window to Brussels. And you're going to be presenting the first one, Yolanda. Exactly. There are two windows to Brussels. The first one is happening right now, the next one later this afternoon. And this is really your opportunity to get to know local, local organizations here in Brussels. I will be calling up um, the individual representatives um, individually. And first up, I would like to invite Aurélie Sea from the Bellevue Museum onto the stage. Welcome, Aurélie. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, right. So hello everyone, I'm Aurélie Cerf. I'm very happy to be here today and to see you, uh, to, to, to see all of you live. I was two years ago in Glasgow, so I'm very, I'm very honored to, to be here again in my city, Brussels. Um, I am head of education in the Bellevue Museum and I'm working with Anne uh, and I'm very happy to, to, to present you my institutions uh, for which I, I've, I've been working for six years now. Um, so like I said, Bellevue Museum is located in Brussels in the city centre next to the Royal Palace. Uh, maybe for some of you, you will get the chance to visit the museum and to attend a workshop given by one of my colleagues, Patrick, who is in this room, uh, so you will discover it maybe tomorrow. Um, the Bellevue Museum is not only a museum, it's actually much more than that. It's a big project with a very ambitious societal goal. And um, the museum is run by the King Baudouin Foundation. Um, yes, I can go on, yes. Um, we, we opened actually um, a center for democracy in 2003 and like I said the museum is run by the King Baudouin Foundation which is um, a, public, uh, a public benefit foundation uh, with a very ambitious societal goal which is working together for a better society. Um, then in 2005, we opened the Bellevue Museum after the Center for Democracy, and it was a museum about the history of Belgium. In two 
2016, we renewed the whole content of the museum and um, we opened a new museum about the Belgian society of today. So now, as we speak about the Bellevue, it's not only the history of Belgium, but really the Belgian society of today, which makes a big difference, uh, big, big difference to us. Um, the target groups that we are uh, trying to reach, well, the answer is very clear young people, young audiences, but also all Belgians. Um, we, we welcome in the museum especially um, people from Brussels, but also people from Flanders and Wallonia. And in a normal situation, normal times, without uh, any global pandemics, we also welcome the museum a lot of foreign visitors. Um, again, in normal times, we welcome 100,000 visitors a year. So you can get maybe a better concrete idea from uh, our public. Like I said, the Bellevue is run by the King Baudouin Foundation, which is a public benefit foundation. And it was set up in 1976 uh, on the occasion of the 25th reign of King Baudouin. Um, the foundation really wants to be an actor for change. And how does the foundation do that? Well, by working on different um, very important social themes like integrity, pluralism, um, promoting solidarity, transparency, and so on and so forth. Why Bellevue Museum? So what do we want to work on? What do we, for which target group do we want to develop things? Um, well, we, re we, we know that the democratic values are not automatically passed down to younger generation. This is the first, uh, first thing that is really important to us is really to, um, to pass down the things to younger generations, which are uh, our target group. Then we also noticed, and mostly in the last decades, that democratic attitudes are often challenged by populist movements. And then finally, peace and democracy are very often taken for granted by young generations. So we really want to work on those three different topics. Yes, so how do we do that with our mission, which is very, very ambitious? So like I said, we are not only a museum, but a very big project. Um, we, we, we have a permanent exhibition, we have temporary exhibition, and we also organize workshops for young audiences about democracy and citizenship education. So we really want to support and stimulate democratic and citizenship education for the public at large, but especially for young people. And the power of critical thinking is very central in our work with young audiences and also the public at large, young adults and adults. Um, and what is really important is that we link the critical thinking always to the um, present situation, the, 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 the Belgian society of today. So people, as they go out of the museum of a, of a workshop, they can, they can comprehend the world with a better understanding. How do we do that? Because it's quite a challenge, right? So, uh, like I said, we organize workshops for uh, young audiences, and it, as we speak about the young audiences uh, at the Bellevue, we start very young. Uh, we give workshop from 10 years old until 18 years old, but we also work with uh, toddlers from three years old, for example, uh, on our permanent exhibition about Belgium and its history. Uh, we also develop and um, um, disseminate uh, different tools uh, because we have an uh, education service with teachers in the museum and the topics we are working on in the workshops and in the tools are always about citizenship education and then democracy at large, its institutions, the democratic values, Europe, the justice, justice system, um, financial education, media education, active citizenship, discrimination and polarization, as Anne was just saying in the welcome speech. Um, like I said, we also work a lot about um, historical consciousness 
And this is what we do mostly on our permanent exhibition, so the one we renewed in 2016. So if you have time during the conference, you are very welcome to come to the museum to visit the permanent exhibition. We also have the, um, the whole year a program with temporary exhibitions, which are always linked from near or far to uh, one topic of the Belgian society. It can be art, it can be history, it can be a bit of everything. And um, working on historical consciousness, we recently um, developed a tool for history teachers about Belgium's colonial past, which is very important in Belgium, as well as a pedagogical map for um, students about the topic. We also developed through years a methodology uh, to work with young audiences during our workshop about citizenship education. Uh, again, for those who have signed up for the workshop tomorrow with my colleague Patrick, who is in the room, you will be experiencing the methodology we are uh, working with during our workshop. We really focus on discussion, dialogue, intera interaction, um, this is really key and the success to raise young audiences interest. So our aim is that at the end of the workshops they are um, better educated citizens, they can be better weapons to uh, apprehend the future. We, we, we won't give, um, we, we won't try to convince them that democracy is a good thing or things like that, we really want them to think critically about different topics and yes, like I said, be better educated citizens. Um, this is the end of my speech. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aurélie, for this insight into Bellevue. I have three questions for you. Um, the first is, what is your favorite workshop? <laughs> um, yep, we can try this one. See if this one works. Or you can stand there. Yes, I can, I can answer you. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, it's quite a difficult question because we have like a lot of workshops and they all are interesting, but if I have to pick one, it will be the one about discrimination. Because it's like a really sen sensitive topic and the experience is like really amazing. Um, so when the, the young people come to the museum, they don't know anything about the theme of the workshop, so they don't know they are coming for a workshop about discrimination, we just, Tell them, okay, you are going to visit the Bellevue Museum, but oh, so bad, the, the, the guide is sick, so you will build up like a poster and it's a contest. And then they will be um, discriminated by one of our okay. facilitators without knowing it. So the teacher knows it, but it's a whole experience with um, an experience of discrimination within the group. And then you can see the different mechanism mm. uh, that can appear in discrimination. That's the discrimination everything know in the society that you can see that they're happening with the young people. Wow. And so in f following the, the, different, um, the, uh, the different groups, the reactions can be very, very different from one group to another. And then at the end, naturally, there is a feedback moment where the young uh, students can express themselves, what were, what were the feelings, how did they feel. Uh, how were their reaction, good, not good? This is one of my favorites. Okay, <laughs> it sounds very powerful and impactful. Thank you so much. Um, the second question I have is, um, what workshop awaits us tomorrow? Uh, Patrick, correct me if I'm wrong and I don't see you in the room. Oh yes, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's Democracy, right? Yes. So it's one of our oldest workshop uh, about, um, about democracy and its institutions. But maybe I won't, tell, I won't tell more about that because I really want you to discover it with Patrick tomorrow and also the methodology around the workshop. Amazing, thank you so much. And for everyone who wants to join this workshop, you would have to register up front. And last but not least, um, what temporary exhibition is on at the Bellevue Museum? right now? 
So we have a temporary exhibition about Raoul Servet. Uh, I don't think anyone knows about him, but he is really famous for, um, for the Be Belgian cinema. Uh, he was one of the pioneers of um, animation film in Belgium. He's still alive, he's 93 years old, and still he has uh, he had the capacity to, to, to build up an exhibition with us. Uh, it's a very beautiful exhibition. So again, you are very welcome to come visit us for all the museum. Another round of applause for Aurelie Serre. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, you can sit here. Yeah. Now I'm very excited to welcome on the stage Andrea La Pena, who is from Lifelong Learning Platform. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a nice welcome. And thank you very much for this. This is very useful. <laughs> if I get to use it. You point it there. It was big enough for me to see, but I didn't. Uh, in any case, thank you very much for the invite. Thank you very much for having me on stage. Um, I wanted to start right off with the presentation of the Lifelong Learning Platform, what it is, what we are, why we do what we do. But I think I will have to start instead with some comments off my script. Because the moment I stepped into the venue, it's the first time after the pandemic, or rather within the pandemic, um, and I could really feel the vibes, the mood. Uh, and this is thanks to the organizers, thanks to the people on stage that are moderating so well this debate. Thank you uh, to all the participants, but also to the people behind the scenes and behind the screens um, for really making it, this happen. I could really sense that it's going to be a fantastic event and a very fruitful discussion. Thank you very much for this. Um, on my presentation, um, I represent the Lifelong Learning Platform. My name is Andrea. I am Italian by birth, by, uh, but Bruxellois by adoption. Um, as I've been living and working here for quite some time, I'm very happy to welcome you to Brussels and to be a partner on this window to Brussels. We have a magnificent venue with amazing windows here, and I'll be more than happy to open one for you onto the associations in Brussels. Um, the Lifelong Learning Platform is uh, an, e an umbrella NGO um, in that we're very active in education and training in Europe. What we do is uh, basically gathering uh, EU associations and non-governmental organizations um, that are active in education and training uh, to foster a lifelong learning vision of the, of the world. We're very proud of this lifelong learning vision and our holistic approach um, because we believe that learning happens everywhere at every time of our lives. And we have a motto that says that learning happens from cradle to grave which is a bit dark if you think about it because it's birth to death, but you get what I mean. Um, and actually, uh, we are so proud of this that in, in the multiple conferences and discussions that we had a few years ago, uh, someone suggested that we actually change the name to lifelong to lifelong and life-wide learning, just to testify of the multiple dimensions that learning can have. Um, for instance, I think that you will be learning a lot in this conference, and it is also a lifelong learning opportunity for us all. Uh, we should not forget that education happens at every time of our lives. Um, and the idea of the Lifelong Learning Platform is really to foster this understanding, this holistic approach to value all kinds of learning. Because of this, we do not only focus on um, formal education, for instance, but we place a great emphasis also on non-formal learning and on informal learning. Um, the idea for us is really to voice citizens' concerns about lifelong learning and to bring their, um, their issues, their concerns, up to the European decision makers. Uh, we're very proud of our network. Our network is 42 European members, and they're very diverse. It's a bit of a cliche to say it, but our strength does come from our members. Um, we have students' organizations, we have teachers' organizations, we have parents, we have migrant education, uh, we have vocational tra training, vocational education training. Uh, we have all sorts of learning that you can think of. We kind of represent it. We're proud of this. Um, again, the, the idea of the Lifelong Learning Platform is really to bring those dimensions, those facets of learning together. So it's only natural that our membership reflects uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of difference. Um, and for us, the role pieces of the, the same puzzle, the same puzzle that brings us to seek and, uh, and build better societies, more inclusive society based on learning. The idea here is that just like citizenship education, that um, through learning we can, uh, we can be better and more involved citizens. Um, 
So our objectives are really to build those inclusive and more democratic societies through um, uh, a better, more inclusive education systems. This, for us, is the key to pretty much everything. Um, to deliver quality education for all citizens, uh, and to increase the relevance of education to our society. For, this, for us, this is, this is important. Education is not a, a very appealing topic when it comes to decision making. You will see that everybody says that education is important, but nobody really does anything about it. Um, we're very sorry about this because really, we really think this it can be a cross uh, sector topic that could potentially. Uh, put everybody in the same direction, um, but we do we do, we do try to have uh, to have an impact on this, especially at European level. Uh, we are a strong European organization, as we said. Brussels is the capital of Europe. Again, another cliche, but it really is in a way that it brings together uh, all European concerns. There's um, Brussels is always famous for for the European institutions, and that's that's of course uh, true. Uh, but there's a whole um, underground of associations like ours that try to influence the decision-making process of the European institutions. Um, and this is just as important as having the EU Commission or the EU Parliament here in the city. Um, so our education sectors, we, I mentioned uh, that we, we work with all uh, sectors of learning, and indeed we do, um, in a way that uh, we start from early childhood education and care, and we work in this area, and we, we move up to schools, higher education, but we also place the utmost importance on adult education, on, on training, on VET, um, on whatever it is, non-formal education outside of the formal schooling systems in Europe, um, and also on informal learning, again, to kind of reinforce the lifelong learning approach. Um, because of this, we work on a, a number of cross-cutting topics. Uh, we are a strongly advocacy-based organization. Our, our mission is really to try and influence the European decision-making process. Um, so we work a lot behind the scenes with members of the European Parliament, with the European Commission, uh, with permanent representations, and we try also to go a little bit beyond the European Union. Uh, lately, we've been trying to engage successfully uh, with the United Nations and with UNESCO. Um, because of this, uh, on the screen you will see some of the topics that we currently work on. Um, the list does not end here. It's just uh, as, a, as an example to see that for us, lifelong learning is really a wide and encompassing concept that can be applied to pretty much every aspect of our lives. Um, and that therefore should be valued in all aspects of our lives. Uh, how do we do so? We have a number of activities, like pretty much everyone in the room. Uh, we have a lot of EU-funded projects through which we're trying to bridge policy and practice uh, to try and preach what we teach, how we say. Um, we held a lot of consultations both within our network and outside of our network. Uh, we have high visibility events. We have an, a one coming up. Uh, it's the Lifelong Learning Week on the 29th of November in Brussels and online, of course. Um, we have LL awards through which we, um, we give awards to the best practices out there in Europe. Uh, we produce a number of policy statements, policy digest, uh, position papers that kind of set out our mood on some of the most important topics out there. Um, we have we actually manage a lifelong learning interest group of the European Parliament with a number of members of the European Parliament that are committed to lifelong learning, uh, together with our members of the EAEA, the European Association for the Education of Adults. Um, we run an Erasmus Plus coalition to discuss uh, the uh, Erasmus Plus program uh, with interesting parties and especially um, non-governmental organizations. We have a number of internal working groups, researchers and studies. We do a lot. I have to tell you, we're only 10 in the team. Scenic pose. Um, and we also have a lot of partnerships. I'm very proud to say that LLP has been uh, collaborating for a long time with Nisi, um, and we're very happy to be a partner of this um, event. We work through thematic years. Um, uh, this year, our topic will be changing nature of evaluation in education and its impact on learners' well being. Why this? Because well being has been uh, a top topic for us since the pandemic. Uh, it's something that has been highly undervalued, uh, the well-being of learners and educators alike. And we thought that it was about time to tackle the well-being dimension of learning, especially within the COVID pandemic, especially within this context of constant and virtual learning, but not only. Because of the assessment practices there are in, in European education systems, we think that it's, it's about time to, to speak about well-being. Join us for the Yellow Week to learn more. We have a position paper coming up. This is it for me. I don't want to welcome my stay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here.
Should I wait for questions? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrea. Let's give a round of applause for this presentation. So interesting. I feel like I just learned so much just by listening to your presentation. Um, and the one question that I have for you is if there's anyone here in the room who wants to get in touch with you as a potential partner, how would they best go about it? If you're in the room and want to get in touch, I will be staying here the whole afternoon. I'm very happy to, to have a chat. Um, in any case, tomorrow we will be having a study visit uh, to our office, so you're also welcome to, to join us if you want to learn more about our activities and or want to get involved in our activities. Um, and we'll, we'll stay around the, in the, during the conference in any case. Perfect. Thank you so much again, Andrea. Cool. <laughs> yeah, take a seat. All right, we have one more window to Brussels in this first section, and um, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome on stage Antrappers um, from Foyer. The stage is yours. Thank you. So, hello, and thank you for inviting me to this conference. It's a very nice uh, place, nice setting, and a nice atmosphere, as others have remarked. Uh, so my name is Anne Trappers and I represent Foyer, which is an organization based in Brussels that has been active in the field of immigrant integration and empowerment for well over 50 years. Uh, on this occasion, I will focus mainly on one of Foyer's more recent projects, which is a museum of uh, migration created around stories, which is why I also decided to tell you a story and to go without a digital presentation uh, tool. I also thought, now that it's partly an offline event, let's make it really uh, not digital for a change. So I don't have nice pictures to show you, but I also invite you to a field trip tomorrow to uh, our organization. You're very welcome uh, to join the trip to register for it. So Foyer was created in 1969 as a youth center in Molenbeek. Molenbeek, one of the 19 Brussels municipalities and one of the less affluent ones. Uh, Molenbeek actually became a center of industrial activity at the time of the Industrial Revolution. And post-World War II, a lot of migrant workers were recruited to work in the, in the industry, in the factories. So that is why um, in the late 60s, Molenbeek was already an area of uh, immigrants. There were a lot of immigrant children as well, and uh, many of them were in a disadvantaged situation. So Foyer actually started as a volunteer uh, initiative to provide after-school activities for immigrant children, language courses also, and then it gradually developed into a more professional uh, non-profit with several subsections. And each of them is focusing on a specific theme or a specific target group. Um, I don't have the time and space to go into the details of all the subsections, um, but they include, apart from the original youth center, which still exists, um, a center for multilingual education, a team of healthcare interpreters, around the 12 uh, women, they're all women, who go to interpret and translate in, mainly in hospitals, but also in schools. Um, there's a sports team, there's a Roma and Traveller service, there's a women's centre and a men's centre, uh, and there's a legal advice service. Now, the overall mission of Foyer is to um, promote integration and empowerment uh, for people of an immigrant background and with a special focus on more disadvantaged uh, people. Empowerment, making people more resilient is probably our main focus, but we also cater to a wider uh, audience. We also provide workshops and information sessions uh, on uh, diversity, media awareness, the history of migration, um, and so on. And for children between uh, 9 and 12 years of age, there's the Palace of the Normal and the Strange, which is an interactive exhibition and workshop on topics such as diversity, um, uh, but also democracy, for instance, where we don't only want to show 
what democracy is and can be, but also what participants, even as kids, uh, can contribute to it. So today I still want to focus a little bit on the latest uh, project of Foyer, which is also one that is destined to a, a wider audience, uh, and that's the Migration Museum. It's called the Migratie Museum Migration in uh, Dutch and French. Um, and uh, we noticed that we had in our archives a lot of material concerning the history of migration and ethnic diversity in Brussels. And at the same time, uh, there wasn't a real migration museum yet, which is strange for a city like Brussels, where actually the majority of the population has migration roots. So um, we decided to do something with this and uh, to create this museum. It opened at the, in, in late 2019, which in terms of visitor numbers wasn't the best uh, possible time to open a museum. But um, st we're still there and uh, we managed to work around the pandemic conditions. Um, so we did not have a location to make a really large scale museum and we decided to use the small human scale to our advantage. We built the museum around people's personal stories. So we reached out to the population uh, and we started to supplement our uh, archival material, which we already had, with lots of um, witness accounts, photographs, videos, objects that told the story of uh, migration to Brussels. And so central to the museum are uh, sets of uh, dioramas, so to speak, boxes, um, in which photographs, objects, pieces of text tell the story of one immigrant. Some of these stories can also be listened to. And then, apart from that, um, we also have um, boxes that are dedicated to specific groups, such as the Roma, or specific themes, uh, such as, for instance, the construction uh, sector. Apart from those personal stories, the museum uh, displays works of art, and these are works by artists who either come from an immigrant background themselves or who have migration as their theme. To give just one example, there are uh, works of art by Italian artist uh, Elia Ligioi, who used um, wreckage and washed up life jackets from Lampedusa to create works of art. And then, in the context of the recent pandemic, we also created a mobile version of the museum, um, which can be taken to schools, for example, and you can also book a virtual guided tour that is called Museum at Home. All in all, the museum is always um, in progress and under construction. Uh, it's a dynamic space and we continually um, expand and update our collection. We also have temporary um, exhibitions, but it's very much a space that invites all of those who helped shape Brussels, um, that invites all of the, those people to give their story its place in the museum. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for this insight into Foyer, dear Anne. Um, this was really insightful. Um, and I think what really stood out to me was this palace for the normal and strange. You said it's mm, particularly targeted for children, but could a grown-up go there too? <laughs> uh, you could go there tomorrow, for okay. instance, on one of our tours. Um, it's also, well, we, we, we do give the workshops for children, but uh, it's also open to, for instance, educators uh, who want to learn about methods to work with uh, children on the topics of diversity or democracy or related things. Amazing. Let's give another warm round of applause for Anne Trapper from Foy Foyer. <laughs> And to everyone here from this first window to Brussels, that is Orly Sir from the Bellevue Museum, Andrea La Pena from Lifelong Learning Platform, and again, Anne Trappers from Foyer. You can sign up at the registration for the field trips happening tomorrow. Thank you so much. You guys can actually go back to the audience. Thank you so much, guys.
All the right. second window to Brussels will be happening later today at 5.20 p.m. And next up, I'm so excited for this upcoming conversation, a panel discussion that I will hand over now to Victor to introduce. Thank you so much, uh, Yolanda. Yes, uh, we have a panel discussion uh, coming up uh, about essentially the future of citizenship education. And we have a couple of very diverse and uh, uh, panelists. I'm gonna welcome them all up to the stage so they can sort of just have their seats while we give them a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Maximilian Rose, Ellen Klaas, Brian E. Hoskins, Abir Haddad and uh, 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 Isabella Negaway is gonna be joining us from Zoom. Let's give these people a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Ellen, you can be over there, please, and you can be over here. All right. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. We very much appreciate having this panel discussion. Uh, we're going to be having a free-flowing discussion here, and we're going to be having a discussion about, as I said, the future of citizenship education uh, in uh, uh, Europe and really around the world, essentially, because we've seen just so many crises these past few years. We've seen uh, a COVID crisis, we've seen a refugee crisis, we've seen a financial crisis even before that, and the question we're basically asking is how can uh, citizenship education better prepare students for exactly those types of transformations that are taking place in society. We've asked two young panelists uh, to, uh, or at least we've asked people to apply to be a young panelist. One of those is you, Max. The other one is joining us uh, from uh, Zoom, and that's uh, Isabella. Uh, we are very happy to have you guys. I'm going to introduce everyone later on, uh, just to give you a brief overview of how this is going to be taking place. Uh, we're going to give everyone the chance to make a statement here, uh, to, to, to talk about some of the issues that they want to raise. Uh, each uh, person gets about a five-minute statement here. Uh, afterwards, we're going to have a, a free-flowing discussion as much as possible about some of the topics you've raised and other topics. Uh, also, we are going to be joined by Andres Gonzalez, all the way from Ecuador, who's going to be talking about some of the differences between uh, European citizenship education and citizenship education in Ecuador. And there is also going to be uh, room for your questions. That is uh, relevant to the audience sitting here in this room, but also to the virtual audience, which uh, actually can uh, contribute questions uh, via Slido. All right, I think all of those things need to be said at the beginning. Um, let's get started with sort of what this is all about. Uh, again, we want to thank all of our panelists for being here. Uh, I want to give you the opportunity just to sort of talk about the broad themes of this. And uh, I want to get to sort of give the audience a chance to get to know you. So we have uh, given everybody a sort of a five minute statement. And the first one uh, is for you, Ellen, um, just to introduce you, because I think it needs to be clear to exactly who you are. You are actually closest to um, uh, our uh, location here, because you are all the way coming to us from Leuven here in Belgium. Yes, did you have a good trip over here? Yes, of course. <laughs> For other people, this is actually going to be a more interesting question, actually, because there are some people coming from a little bit further than that. Uh, but we're very happy to have you here. Uh, just to be clear, you are a associate professor at the Faculty of Social Sciences at the Catholic University of Leuven. And in your work, you explore the effects of second that secondary schools have in shaping democratic knowledge, attitudes, and skills in young people. Yes. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Uh, I would say, uh, take us along with your view on the topic of this panel. Okay, um, this panel is about the future of civic education. And uh, yesterday, a very smart uh, colleague of mine told me that when you're asked as an expert on a panel, it's only afterwards that you can think again. <laughs> but I want to challenge him uh, in, on that. And I actually want to think together with you what the future of civic education can and should look like uh, in my point of view. Um, I, I guess that everything I see happening in the future is also based on research we already did in the past. And with uh, civic education, we really have the advantage that we have very good cross-sectional but also longitudinal um, follow-up studies that look into how civic competences develop in youth and how they indeed are still malleable when kids are are uh, between the age um, of 8 and uh, 25. So I think that, first of all, is a, a very important thing to take with me. 
Um, from that research, we know that in schools, uh, an open classroom climate is very important. Uh, that students can talk openly with their teacher, that, can, that they can differ from opinion, and that they can do so in a safe uh, climate. On the other hand, we also know from American literature that has been around for much longer. Uh, the research on civic education has been more popular uh, in, in the US uh, before. We know from there that inviting controversy in that safe environment that the classroom is and that mini democracy is a, a very, very useful tool too. So we know uh, open classroom climate, but also inviting controversial controversy, controversial issues actually works. But it all works, we say, it starts with a safe environment. But of course, the world of today, where our kids grow up in, where adolescents grow up in, isn't necessarily safe. And that's uh, the, the starting point I took for looking at the civic education of the future. And I actually am inspired um, by what David Campbell uh, mentioned in his study, like the, um, the appreciation of conflict. I think we can learn uh, young people to really appreciate conflict and by appreciating conflict also be able to move on and to move um, over the conflict. So I think when looking at the students, looking into their appreciation of conflict and stimulating that in a safe environment will make them more, um, yeah, more, more strong um, to develop their civic competences later on. Next to this, I also do think that we should not only look at the students, at future citizens. But these students are also guided by, for example, their teachers. And when teachers are confronted with uh, controversy in their classroom, they sometimes feel very vulnerable. And I also guess that looking into the vulnerability and the frailness of teachers when dealing with those controversial issues is something we should consider um, in future civic education and future civic education research. And uh, last but not least, and I think we saw that with all the Youth for Climate movement, I also think that civic education can be and should be maybe a little bit disruptive. Civic education should not strive to, um, to strive to stability of the system, but maybe should strive to the persistence of the democratic system more than to the stability. So this is how I look at the future of civic education, and this is also going to be, I guess, my, my future uh, research agenda. Yeah. This uh, sounds uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. We're going to be talking about some of these things. I think what you said about how stability is not as important as being disruptive is actually fascinating. So I think this uh, really is going to be very interesting to talk about more in depth later on. Uh, I want to introduce our next panelist because as I said, we have two young members who apply to be part of this panel. And the first one is joining us from Romania by Zoom. Isabella, good, mm, good afternoon to you. How are you? Afternoon. I'm fine. Thank you. That's I'm really excited for, for what's next. Wonderful. We are very happy to hear that. Uh, to introduce you, as I said, you are from Romania. You graduated from university this past summer, and you are a partnership and communication manager of Station Europe, which is a European NGO working for young people. Um, what did you uh, do? What was your degree that you graduated from university in? Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, actually, I graduated in uh, journalism and uh, media. This is the, the main field. Uh, actually, uh, more precisely, it was a degree, a double diploma degree uh, based on uh, communication, solidarity and NGOs. So this is my, my main specialization right now. Okay, wonderful to hear that. Uh, you have uh, the chance to uh, talk to us uh, for about five minutes with your opening statement as well. Thank you very much. Uh, hello once again, everyone. It's such a pleasure to join you on this year's conference. I'm incredibly happy that we can discuss today the topic of education, which is my favorite. Uh, and one of the strongest causes I have dedicated myself uh, to in the last five years. 
I would like to start my intervention today with some words about how I see the status of the education and how I imagine it to be starting from now on. But as a disclaimer, I will be referring to uh, the kind of education I have experienced in, and this is the non-formal education. Um, as a person that went through a, a few educational NGOs mostly and a young woman fresh out of the university benches, I believe that civic and citizenship education is crucial uh, at this time, precisely because it has this transformative power to uh, remind society that the active participation of every citizen supports the community. I think that this citizenship education is the best weapon in these times uh, when we are struggling with disinformation, with low interest and maybe lack of motivation among young people uh, who are affected by online school, pandemic and also by the deteriorating social contact. And I strongly believe that now more than ever, complementary models are needed, non-formal education to support teachers, librarians in their endeavors. Um, it is a time when the creators also have at their disposal an almost unlimited field, a unique opportunity to open the dialogue where it has not been open for a long time. Citizenship education is vital in times of crisis because it focuses on the here and on the now. And I think that this is the greatest advantage, the fact that it's based on a network of uh, dynamic people ready to act now. We talk uh, today and um, also in these times a lot about the future because somehow uh, the present bothers us, the present scares us. The education of the future starts today, fortunately or unfortunately, and is clearly one that is becoming more and more digital, one that uses tools and shapes as close as possible to the digital screens. And I think that the classroom will have to look more like a digital window. And this is not only a subjective opinion. It's something based on what we have experienced with uh, the children in our project. Things should look more like uh, posts on Instagram. And teachers will need our help to learn to deliver the information in such a dynamic way as, for example, to simulate a video on TikTok. So we are talking a lot about adaptation, I think. Um, about an education that can no longer remain in old textbooks, but must go out into the world and learn to teach us dynamically and, in and interactively uh, as possible. As for the civic education, it must no longer remain something uh, optional, an auxiliary that attaches when needed, but must be uh, more deeply integrated into educational structures. And here I'm talking also about the situation in Romania where we have an acute need to feel that civic education is part of the process, not just a subject of choice. And uh, I will uh, tell you a, a little story. A good mathematician, for example, a good engineer or chemist or writer needs to know how to be a good citizen, to understand the world and to be informed. These things will make uh, even more of a difference in the future and progress will be for those who uh, will understand that success means more than knowing how to do your job. It's not going to be uh, any longer only about hard skills. And this is a, a good point to keep in mind, I think. And last but not least, when I say that education should be more digital, I don't want to exclude uh, the offline interaction, which is greatly needed. I'm trying to underline the fact that young people, as I am, together with their teachers and parents, should learn more and more how to transfer notions that they find online in the real world to learn better how to make connections between these two. And that's all for the moment. I'm really uh, excited for the next questions and for the next approaches. Thank you so much. Isabella, thank you so much for that opening statement here. We appreciate that. Um, moving on to the third uh, panel uh, member. Uh, we, as I said, we have two young people here, and the second one is our third panelist. Uh, Maximilian Rose, that's your name. Uh, we can say Max here. Um, you are a last year school student from Germany. Much of your time is actually, much of your free time is actually spent on citizenship education uh, because you're a part of the Young European Professionals, which is a German peer education network aiming to uh, foster a better understanding of the EU. Uh, it is quite difficult for many people to understand the EU, right? That is true. 
Yes. It is a super complex organization. There are many prejudices out there. And what we're trying to do is foster this understanding and really combat all these prejudices at a very young age. Exactly. Uh, you are also our youngest panel member here. How old are you? I am 19 years old. That is wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, give him a round of applause for being 19 years old and sitting on a panel with experienced researchers. I really appreciate that. All right, we've given everyone about five minutes, so you have uh, your time as well uh, to present us how, what your view is on citizen education in the future. Thank you very much. Um, this year's panel has the title Committed to Change. I would, like my, I would like to start my statement with a sentence or with an idea that might seem controversial to some because I don't think we are supposed to be the change makers. I don't think we as citizenship educators should be the ones to initiate change around the world. We are far too decentralized of a group, far too small, often far too homogeneous of a group. And it's simply not possible for us to have a huge impact on society and on the systems surrounding us. And honestly, I think that's good. It would be absolutely undemocratic if we had that power as the small and homogeneous group. It would go against all the values that we teach. So if we're not the star players out on the field, if we're not the ones to change the world, who are we? What's our role? That's the big question now. I like to think of us as the coaches on the sideline. We're the scouts out there trying to find the next change makers, trying to create the next change makers, the next star players on the field. Um, to do that, I think we have, to, for one, to support the existing networks, the, uh, the existing systems that are out there in the world. For example, democracy, the systems that the population deems worthy, not the ones that we deem worthy. Secondly, our big task is, in my opinion, to create, actually, the change makers, to make sure that they're out there, to make sure that there are people, young people, who want to change the world. This big task is kind of uh, separated into bit two subtasks. For one, to do that, we have to increase our outreach. We have to talk to far, more, far many more people. We have to teach more people in all groups of the population. Secondly, I think we have to change the way we conduct citizenship education and make sure that people go out of the workshops that we conduct, go out of the events that we have organized with a feeling of, I want to do something. I want to change something. We have to create this urge to change. Let me start, though, with the outreach first. Um, I think Isabel made a great point there that citizenship education should not be an auxiliary tool in uh, traditional educational institutions. I think we should work more together with schools, with uh, other institutions like universities, kindergartens, and create systems that are regularly repeating, for example, a workshop each year for each kid. Because otherwise, all these children in school will still be learning out of textbooks, and they won't be learning out of textbooks, I can tell you that. Um, I learn more in a workshop than from a teacher. Secondly, I think we have to also reach the group of adults. The adult population is way larger than the youth population, of course. And Unfortunately, they're more important in elections. Elections are won by adults, not by young people, as much as we would like that too. So we have to reach those people as well. Bigger problem now is how do you reach adults? Everyone has jobs, everyone has a family, everyone has no time, full calendars. Still, we have to reach these people because they're the backbone of elections, they're the backbone of democracy. So my idea is we should go into the jobs. We should talk to corporations, to employers. We should try to set up workshops with them as well so we can reach these people as well to maintain our democracy and probably find the next change makers. Lastly, I think we should rethink, or to increase our outreach, I think we should rethink our connection or our use of social media. Uh, especially during the pandemic, I think most of us have experience citizenship education on the phone, through Zoom, and I think we can all agree it's not the same. There's a difference between sitting here, talking to people, learning something in person, than just sitting in a Zoom lecture in your own bed, probably jogging pants on and eating your breakfast. It's not the same learning experience and it often doesn't work. So we really have to rethink how we want to teach over the internet if we want to continue that because it has huge possibilities. Going on to the second big point, how do we actually create these change makers? How do we actually 
create this urge within the people that we're talking to to change the world around them. Um, Isabel, again, gave me a great way to start here. Textbooks don't help. Um, people don't learn from textbooks. People especially don't get active from reading a textbook. For example, I can uh, give a presentation about refugee camps. I can give a presentation about Moria and the conditions there, how many people are there. Well, it's sad and everything, but the students I'm giving this presentation to are not are going to be moved for five minutes, maybe, and then they're going to forget about it. Because facts don't move us to really get active. Facts don't move us that much to do something. I say we should try to change our approach there. Maybe um, help people get emotionally invested in these issues because when they are, they are re really going to care about what is being talk talked about and then they want to change something. I think if we gave people the opportunities how to um, engage into a certain topic that we're talking about, they would actually engage. Again, using an example of the refugees, if I give my a presentation about refugees or refugee camps and go home, well, good job. But if I give my presentation about refugee camps and then tell the people, well, you've seen the conditions, you have maybe formed a connection to this, now I'm going to show you how you can change that. I'm going to show you the organizations you can get involved in. You can, I can show you the ways you can change something. Then you're more, more inclined to actually do so. To summarize my kind of list here of what we should do, we're the coaches. We're not the star players. We're not the change makers. Our job is to support existing um, systems like democracy and to create change makers for the problem fields that are still out there. How do we do that? Increase our outreach, create the urge to, ch to get active within the people. And thank you very much, Victor. Thank you very much, Max, for your opening statement here. We appreciate that very much. Uh, moving, yes, please do give him a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> moving on to our uh, fourth speaker in this uh, panel, uh, Bryony Hoskins. She is a professor of comparative social science at the University of Roehampton in the United Kingdom. You made your flight here to, into, this, um, uh, into Brussels today or yesterday? I came by train today. You came by train. Oh, wonderful. That's very environmentally friendly of you. Well done. Um, I just want to point out that she's done some uh, groundbreaking research in the field of measuring active citizenship, civic competence, and the learning of political engagement. We're going to be talking about that later on. But of course, you have an opening statement as well. Thank you. And it's so nice to have a real audience here. I really <laughs> appreciate to be able to talk to people. Um, and what I wanted to begin by is uh, reflecting on um, a recent publication which just came out a couple of weeks ago from UNESCO and uh, the Council of Europe. And it's uh, some research uh, which we undertook uh, in the Middle East and North Africa and in Europe uh, in order to find out what was the uh, impact or the uh, effect of uh, the pandemic on student voice. I think this is really important because it gives us some context uh, and some, you know, about what students and what young people lost during this uh, period of time and what we learned from this about what we need to do going forward. So it included a teacher survey as well as uh, case studies. And so there were some key points which I think are important to take forward. So one third of young people were not involved in any decision making uh, about their uh, school uh, experience during lockdown. So uh, this is according to the teacher survey. So uh, according to the teacher survey, then there was a 52% drop in the running of school councils or any form of uh, formalized governance structures uh, within, the, uh, within schools. So the formal structures uh, uh, for young people to give their voice, this declined dramatically. There's about a 50% drop in citizenship activities in the communities. So this means uh, actions that young people were undertaking to make changes in the local community, also volunteering activities organized by the school. This dramatically dropped. And one of the things which Ellen was talking about, which is hugely important in schools, the possibility just to have a classroom discussion this drops about by 30% uh, for young people. 
And since we know all these kind of activities are critical in uh, the long-term development of political engagement, we know that um, the, we can imagine then that the experiences of two lockdowns will have a long-term uh, impact, uh, unmeasurable or unknown, but will have an impact on young people's uh, future political engagement. So this is something that we really need to think about in terms of how to compensate for the loss of uh, citizenship, education, learning during the pandemic and the two lockdowns. What we found uh, across the, both the Middle East and North Africa and Europe is that there were a certain number of factors about citizenship education projects which were able to continue and able to keep going during uh, the lockdown period because some managed and some uh, uh, achieved uh, uh, very innovative and creative things during this time. And we found that these uh, took place in uh, schools which had very committed uh, school leaders, very committed citizenship education teachers, and sometimes very uh, committed uh, students, student leaders as well. We saw it really important was the relationship between the students and teachers. So before going to, into lockdown, strong relationships, strong bonds had already been formed between the young people and the teachers, which meant that when they were in this lockdown, when they were online, or in a very stressful condition, then the, the learning was able to continue the projects, the innovation. We saw that uh, the case studies could take place in schools with a strong civic culture where participation was already part of uh, the uh, daily lives and the daily curriculum across the schools. Uh, and where schools already had partnerships with uh, community organizations like the cultural organizations we heard today, um, but we heard uh, ones that had good connections with the theatre. They were able to then do uh, projects which were going to be actual theatre instead, turned to online theatre, or they moved from working uh, with a, a previous project on museums, so adapting the museum project to putting things from their everyday experience of the pandemic into a virtual museum. So these kind of activities uh, could continue. And so it was where there was uh, schools or um, where that, uh, they had a very strong civic project and civic culture at the school. Then these projects were able to adapt, to change, to innovate. But where this strong civic culture didn't, wasn't there, it was very hard for new projects to come out or, or new, you know, new development and new ideas unless the solid foundations and those solid uh, relationships uh, within the school had been built up. But nevertheless, the last thing which I think uh, is important to take forward from this is that even in those uh, most participatory schools, even in the most innovative projects, it wasn't student voice, it wasn't young people being involved in decision making. And how fast under a situation of crisis, under a situation of pandemic or any kind of crisis, that things you know, like student get voice get lost very quickly and that only if these are really prioritised within the education system or within uh, the civic education or non-formal education, only when this is top priority in everyday life will this manage to still stay and continue to be there in times of crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. Let's give her indeed a big round of applause. Thank you so much for that opening statement. And then uh, last, but certainly not uh, least, we have uh, Abir Haddad here. She is a legal futurist and a comparative lawyer. She is also an adjunct professor at the Institute for International Private Law at the University of Cologne. Thank you very much for being here. Did you have a good trip over here? Uh, yes, more or less. My, I mean, Deutsche Bahn, you can't expect too much, <laughs> but <laughs> it was okay. Last time I had like three hours delay, but oh, this time wow. it was just... Less than an hour, an okay. hour, which is okay. Which is actually... It's good for Deutsche Bahn. Yes, Bond. exactly. Absolutely. One hour delay is actually Can't pretty complain. good. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's not bad. All right, we're very happy that you're here. We have an opening statement from you as well. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me here at all. I mean, I'm quite impressed by, by the opening statements of um, the other panelists, and I'm not very much into, like, uh, 
civic education like the other panelists are, but I think I'm invited because I, I work with the future or I just take a look, uh, I try to take a look at the future and like um, try to find out how could we create the, the future, but especially the future of law or the law in the future. So what you did mention, I work for the UNFCCC, which is the climate change secretary. Um, I consult there in a project named um, Resilience Frontiers. In this project, we have a completely new approach, which is a foresight-driven approach, um, where we try to f figure out challenges we're going to face in the future beyond 2030 and try to, f to um, create solutions for them. Um, like not not only um, not only working on, on on solutions for the here and now and the present. We know that we ha we will face many many challenges uh, um, because of climate change and exponential technologies. We already some kind of know it's coming, but nobody wants to look at like ooh it's scary. So take this like taking on this challenge and try to look at those challenges we're gonna face and and think about it now. So all, all like my head is always in the future. So don't 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 ask me anything about implementing the law right now. I don't care. I just want to know. Uh, everything about the law in, f in the future. So why, why, why do, did I speci specialize on that? It's because I know climate change is going to bring us a lot, a lot, a lot of new challenges. We even, we do, we even do not realize right now. I think the future f for Friday movement is like more aware than we, like uh, other generations are. Uh, but the latest report of the IPCC um, um, just showed us uh, what could happen or what, what will happen, and we, we should not like look away. And um, let's say try to figure out legal solutions or re regulations for these challenges we're going to face in the future is something I'm working on. Um, therefore, I combine comparative um, law methods, which is like my field of expertise in original, with foresight thinking, which is this futurism, which is you, you go into the future and try to figure out what's going to happen and how can I create solutions for that right now. So the, the, other, the other challenge we're going to face is the ex exponential technologies. Like, I mean, um, the panel has just named few how it's going to change the way we educate kids. But it's like this is something we just can feel with TikTok and Instagram. But there are so many things um, we will face in the future, like how, how, how will AI change the way we live with each other, our way of decision making, how will um, robotics change the way we do medicine, for example. And uh, these questions we will just like, we know it's happening, we know um, 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 it's evolving, but let's say decision makers and lawmakers don't look at it because like, it's, it's not urgent right now. But here's the, here's the problem and here why I'm so excited about this topic. The same happened to us uh, with the internet. The internet was like something playful, something is coming, oh, we will, we will figure it out when it's there. And it becomes stronger and stronger and less regulated because it wasn't regulated. So we have a bunch of gray zones and when, especially the EU started like trying to regulate, it was already too late and already too big. Like I can tell you stories. So this is what I am afraid of, that it could happen to us again with many exponential technologies. So what does this have to do with civic education? So my point is um, try to um, bring some awareness on that law is not um, it, like it's not it's not real. It's just a fiction, and it's nothing stand in stone. We can change it, and I hope if more and more people realize this, that oh my God, it's law or it's illegal or legal. Um, then we, we were more willing, as you said, and I loved how you said, it, you said it, then if we know what's possible, then we're more willing to change. So law is just a fiction. We can change it. What we thought was legal before, like slavery was legal before, or um, smoking <laughs> in closed um, rooms. It was just like, I don't know, a few years ago, it was also legal, but it's not legal anymore, and now we can't even imagine. So if you start opening up your minds, what is possible and not possible legally, then we will 
we, mm, we will like find more the courage to push the decision makers and politicians in the EU and worldwide towards the change. And just a last message, again, law is just a re reflection of our values. So what are our values we're living up to right now, which are reflected in our law? Think about that. And what are the values we want to live um, in 2030 or 2040, especially when we have this exponential technologies, which will be quite, yeah, advanced. So we, don't, we, we don't, do not know how we're going to figure this out. But we need to have this value conversation right now to create law or something equal to law because like blockchain based smart contracts are a thing like I, I can't go into too detail right now or like a decentralized financial systems it's like it's um, things we need to now work on and um, talk about so we will not got overwhelmed in 2030 so that's it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give a big round of applause to Abir Haddad as well. Thank you very much for your opening statement. We really appreciate that. All right, let's move into the discussion. And I invite you all to, be, uh, 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 to interrupt each other if that's possible. If you want to contribute to something, do not wait for me to necessarily ask you a question. I will certainly ask you all questions, but I want it to be a natural, free-flowing free discussion, um, as if we were just sort of sitting around a table in a restaurant and having a discussion about this. Let me actually start with the two uh, young uh, people who have applied here. And Isabella, let me ask you very specifically, uh, what is the reason that you applied for uh, this chair in this panel? And in a broader sense, what motivates you to participate in uh, citizenship education? Yeah, that's my favorite question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, from the first moment I saw the call, uh, I knew it was an extraordinary opportunity to participate because from my point of view, participation is the basis of our evolution and also participation stands as a pillar for this citizenship education. I consider that I am at an age when I don't want to miss any learning opportunity and I really hope that many, many people around Europe and not only uh, think the same. Moreover, um, I attended the European Youth event in Strasbourg some time ago, where many young people said that they don't feel sufficiently consulted when it came to decisions being taken at European level on their future. And maybe this is true, but I'm here also to prove that Today, this is not the case because today uh, I feel that I have a context where my opinion matters and my voice can be heard. And I chose to get involved because I think that nothing can be solved just by sitting in the shadow and looking and observing. Of course, observing and research is very important, but we don't have to stop only by doing this. Um, what would it be, for example, to like to complain later that no one listens to my idea if I myself don't have the courage to say, to say my ideas or my opinions or my, my projects that I have in mind? In addition, um, I also knew that this context would put me face to face with other people from whom I could learn. And this is exactly like this because from what I heard, uh, what I've heard until now, uh, I took a lot of notes and that's amazing uh, and I, I, I know that here there are many people who could share with me experiences from their culture, context and beyond. Yeah. Unfortunately, I can be there physically but even so I, I'm very, very happy uh, and I did my best to connect from uh, the distance because this is a chance that no young person should miss. Exactly. And this is very simple. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you. Max, does that apply uh, to you as well? Because I think one of the things that Isabella, um, I think, very much correctly points out is the fact that some people feel they have no influence over what happens in the European Union. And it's also frequently a lack of knowledge. Is that something that motivates you as well? I, I can actually tell you a story about that lack of knowledge. Um, the last German elections, they happened in September, and I was helping out at a polling station. And at some point, this old lady walked in. I s assume she was around 80, 90 years old. And after we gave her all the ballot papers and her pencil, 
she stood there in the middle of the room looking at us and asking, well, what am I supposed to do now? So we explained to her, well, you have to go there in that, into that cabin and vote now. Um, we can't see what you're voting. So she takes all her stuff. She goes into the little cabin, looks at her paper, stands up again, comes to us and asks us, well, where should I put my cross? So, so much about the lack of knowledge. It was quite shocking to me that this person, having lived um, in a democracy so long, didn't quite know what she was supposed to do there. And I think it's actually dangerous this lack of knowledge sometimes because democracy is built upon this very premise that we all know what's going on, that we all are rational human beings that are voting based on their interests. And if I don't really know what's going on there, then I might, fall prey, I might fall, fall prey to populist parties, to extremist parties, which are actually trying to undermine democracy. I think citizenship education is actually the way to fight this missing knowledge to fight this lack of knowledge and to make sure that the pillar of democracy, a broad understanding of what's going on, a broad understanding of the system, is still given. Hmm, that's fascinating. Uh, Brian, one of the things that uh, I was actually shocked during your opening statement because the effects of the pandemic, as you pointed out with statistics, has been huge on education, really huge. It, we're still in this crisis. It's not over yet. In fact, there might be uh, some parts which are slightly getting worse uh, than we are currently in right now. If you look at the future, what do you think is the lasting impact of the COVID crisis on citizenship education in the future? Okay, um, okay it's a slightly different question to what I was expecting. But okay, the lasting impact of the COVID crisis well, I think it's on the young people themselves. And I think that this is what we're going to have to reflect on in the future of uh, citizenship education, is that in the next 10 years, uh, 10, 15 years, the young people who we're teaching, who we're working with, are going to have what has been referred to as a pandemic scar. Uh, and that uh, many young people are now dealing with uh, high levels of anxiety, uh, depression, many uh, emotional things which have come from the pandemic. Uh, and this is only compounded on with uh, uh, additional uh, anxieties to do with climate change, which was mentioned. And uh, we're going to have to work with uh, a generation, uh, at least, uh, one whole cohort of people who are very anxious uh, about their future, and rightly so, because uh, we don't know if there are any more pandemics, but for sure with climate change there are going to be big problems, and if the COP26 doesn't, you know, it's has been called, at least in the UK context, the, the last chance for, for something to be done. I mean, what happens if something isn't done? These young people have to live with this and the anxiety of this. Uh, and I think that uh, this means in terms of future citizenship education that we really need to work very carefully with young people and try to find the things which can be changed within the local context, within the, within the school, to build confidence that small things can be changed in their environment uh, and to really work on resilience for the future because uh, they're going to need all the resilience that they can. Certainly, yes, I can absolutely imagine that resilience is incredibly important in these trying times. Uh, Ellen, your research uh, subject focuses on the relationship between uh, school characteristics, um, citizenship education and democratic attitudes. You talked about that in your opening statement in, in regards to the fact that there needs to be an open and safe environment. Uh, the classical school base was essentially largely moved into the digital space. This is what's been happening for the past 18 months or so. Uh, how did the pandemic affect your research subject? Well, um, I, I want to link a bit to what Bryony uh, told us in her opening statement, because indeed I, I, I feel that um, schools, but also organizations in contact with schools, are like the mini societies where where kids can practice uh, practice in participation. Um, and there, uh, for example, um, Bryony also mentioned um, schools with a good school culture who are involved with the kids. They actually moved those participation
mitigation measures, practices, they move them online. And I, I'm thinking about good practices, uh, for example, the Ola project in Germany, where indeed you have a kind of youth platform, digital platform online, where, where kids can, can uh, really also participate. So I think there, these digital good good practices um, are, are something that we should cherish and we should also investigate more. But again, these things happen when something is already there in a school, when the school culture is already democratic or the culture of the organization um, that um, educators work with uh, is democratic. So I think that's, that's one important answer. Um, secondly, um, I also want to refer to something we know from research and that's uh, digital network participation. So actually young people do already participate a little bit differently than, than, than you and I. <laughs> um, so they actually indeed voice their voice on social media, for example, and they also connect uh, on social media. When you look at uh, the Youth for Climate movement, you could maybe say, following Bennett and Zekerberg, that it's more connective action than it is collective action. Like Collective action is really linked to brick and mortar organizations, uh, linked to houses, uh, so, so to speak, but the connective action is linked to young people interacting I'm looking at the young people <laughs> on social media. But another important aspect of the interacting on social media is that they come together physically too. And you see that also now that the pandemic is somehow, it's not over, but um, young people have more space to come together again, that you can see that that connective action really also needs that connection uh, in real life. So I think it's not like it, it, the digitalization can also bring good things uh -huh. and we, we have uh, we seen good practices, but it's not the world and the connection between young people and civic education cannot only move to the digital space. You really need uh, to see each other in real life and, 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 and to be able to talk about it and to be a bit disruptive too, so that's I suppose. Right. But you can, <laughs> you can say that I'm wrong. <laughs> Please, Max, yeah, absolutely. No, actually, uh, I totally agree, especially with that last statement about we can't have citizenship education just in the digital space. We have, as Young European Professionals, my organization, we have took a, a long time to come up with digital cons uh, concepts for workshops. It really took a long time because we had to kind of translate all, our, all of our methods. And when we started doing our digital workshops, we realized this is terrible. This is boring. <laughs> this is annoying. It's very difficult because you have the Zoom si silence. You have the constant interruption. You have these three seconds of waiting until someone that somebody is answering, or simply the back, black background, just with the Zoom name. And you're sitting there as the um, workshop leader, and you're kind of in despair because you see all these black, um, there's all these black backgrounds. And you can't just be like, oh, you and you, I have your name tag now, like in a classroom, I'm gonna call you on, what do you think about this? Because that Zoom, that doesn't work here. I've also experienced myself that learning digitally is super difficult, especially in school. It's not the same to read of a PDF or to listen to a teacher th speak to you through a conference because you can't, can't ask questions, you can't talk to your neighbors in a good way, not just gossiping and everything, but actually talking about what is taught right now. And that's really missing in the digital space. Bryony? I would just like to add to that that I think this is one thing that we've really learned from the pandemic is that the digital doesn't replace the online world. You can have some additional sessions, additional uh, parts to a, a course or something, a citizenship education course online, but if you don't have those initial connections and bonds, then it's very hard to uh, do that digital learning. Yeah. I mean, this is both from the research and also from the experience of teaching online, and it, uh, the students just didn't 
you know, didn't learn in the same way without having those initial bonds that you create at the start of a course. Yeah, I think it's actually interesting because I think what a, a lot of people here are raising is the fact that the digital space can be a great complement to the physical space, but it cannot replace the physical space. However, and I think that's the point I think you made, if I'm summarizing you correctly, um, for a lot of young people, the digital space is something that comes very naturally to them, so it makes sense to explore that, to use that as much as possible. Uh, Abir, if, if, if you, uh, uh, what is your viewpoint as a, uh, a legal futurist in this uh, discussion? Uh, what do you think of the digital space versus the physical space? Um, I absolutely agree. Like we need both because um, as, as it doesn't matter how 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 far we get. Let's say how, how we develop our technologies, our tools. Um, like we still stay humans, and um, our brains, um, our brains work in a like emotionally in a certain way. So we need emotions, we need other people. But I'm not an expert in that. I just know that I need it. But I have also quite good experience with giving workshops online because, like, um, I do it. I try to do it differently, like with engaging the people, and I laugh a lot. So people. Um, engage quite right. So I think also it depends on like the teachers and 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 the facilitators. But still, it's like I'm I'm so happy being like physically somewhere and like talking to people physically again. Like this is not uh, replaceable, yeah. as you just said. But if I may, may add something Thank to you. what what she um, said about um, um, the, the consequences of the pandemic. Um, on the young people, on the students, and how oh, it sounds so awful to me, and it is, but I mean, it's not the pandemic. Let's just just follow me a little, little bit with my lawyer's brain, okay? Uh, it's not actually it's not the pandemic which causes caused this damage to 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 the students or young people's um, psychological. I don't know how you call it. Um, hmm? Well-being. Well, be, yeah, okay, uh, mental health be, being, let's say. It's actually the decisions we did, we took on taking them out of school, on like separating them, on not teaching them well at home, not, not keeping up with them. Like um, we in Germany, I can't say we did well. Uh, we have uh, like a lot of movements, like uh, Verena Bauster. What should have happened? What, what should have, have happened? Of, like, of course, using the digital space more to to um, to give the young people guidance, or like let them get to. Get, I, I don't know. Like, I'm, a, I'm not a virologist, uh, so I can't I can't decide what ha should have been done. But I, I just see it's our decision we took. So what what make me thinking? We decide. Like because we have the power because we are older and we have politicians and whatever and we can, we we just ca can uh, pass laws and it affects them and affects their future. So there, there's something very interesting hap interesting happened lately. We have a new court's decision of the um, federal uh, federal constitutional court in Germany, and it was the first time where the court ruled that the future of the young people is actually to be to be protected right now by the law so this this just reminded me but the the court the court's ruling was on climate change so a um, group of young uh, of young uh, people with like ngos went to the court and said like th the the laws and regulations of germany they do, do not got, get far enough to reach um, or like to hold on the Paris Agreement, which is like keeping the 1.5 um, degree level. Yeah. So um, it's not possible, like a court can't force lawmakers to change the law of something we don't know, not, do not know in the future. So this is the first time where the future of the young people is something to be protected and is to, to be uh, like the laws to be changed according to. And I think this is something we need to implement more and more in other fields, also in education when we think about education, not how much do we have now and to spend on schools rather than spending on, I don't know, football, but 
what is our... Uh <laughs> <laughs> more consideration of young people, that is what you're advocating for, and that is one of the important things, because I think a lot of people can absolutely agree with you that young people have been severely impacted by the COVID crisis, so that is absolutely a great point. I want to uh, sort of turn to the future, because we've been looking back so far, we've been looking back at the uh, pandemic and how it has affected citizenship education. We also want to look in this panel towards the future. Uh, Max, if I can ask you this question, um, you're the youngest member of our panel, you have uh, presumably the longest future ahead of you. Uh, if you think of the future, what are the biggest challenges for you? As of now? Yes. Um, I think we can all agree that we live in a time of change. We have climate change, we still have globalization, we still have the internet and digitalization going on. We have hot and cold wars raging through the world, plus um, rising extremism. So there are a lot of challenges, a lot of changes, sure. But that has been in the past as well. I think every time is a time of change. And what I think the real challenge is, is not necessarily climate change or the rising extremism, because COVID has shown us how we can react to challenges if we really have to, how fast we can change our system if we are forced to do this. Just think about shutting down the economy, which would have been absolutely crazy before that. What I think the challenge right now is that that we have to acknowledge the changes that are being in front of us. We have to acknowledge that there have to be, has to be made severe changes to our econ economic, economic system, to our political systems maybe, to face the challenges that we currently see. I think the acknowledgement of the changes is the biggest problem because we all like to sit back and enjoy what we know, but acknowledging the problems and the changes means we have to abandon this sure future that we know and dive into the unknown. I think that is really the problem right now. And you can link this to youth participation as well if you have Fridays for Future. We young people, we're not that committed to the um, safe future that older people, I'm sorry, think they might have. Um, older people, have lived more years, they have had more time to get attached to the life they know, to the um, ways life goes. Whereas younger people haven't had that time and therefore are probably better suited to reimagine the future and imagine it within a change. Thank you. Uh, well, I, f I find that to be interesting, what Max is saying, Ellen, because a lot of these challenges they need good citizens, they need good citizenship education. Your research focuses on uh, democratic attitudes and how you can develop them. Um, can you explain to people what exactly democratic attitudes are? Yes. <laughs> um, well, uh, I, for example, we have a very important democratic attitude, I think, um, and, and it's already mentioned here today, uh, and it's, it, it's respect. Um, I think that's a very important democratic attitude. Respect for each other, um, respect, respect for, other for each other, perhaps. respect for other opinions. Also, what I what I mentioned in in, in the beginning, like the, um, the 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 respect also for for the differentness of, of of people and for the different opinions. That's also a very important at, uh, attitude. Looking into more the intercultural uh, competences and attitudes, you also have the tolerance. Um, so these are, I think, one of the main um, democratic attitudes, also political trust. Yeah. And then I'm referring to the, the um, then I'm referring to my the five five minutes talk. Um, so we so we actually want. I also think young people want democracy. Uh, they think it's important and they also value that they can participate and voice concerns and actually they, I think you deserve to be heard more, especially like you explained, because it's, it's the, the, the future, yeah, the future is yours and it shouldn't be ours. So it definitely is something um, that we should consider. How do you teach these attitudes? Mm -hmm. Because that's, I think, yeah. the difficult yeah. part, and many people struggle with that. Uh, yeah. Respect, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. is incredibly mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Uh, but, but there's sometimes a lack of respect in the classroom. Yes, yes. And actually, we, we have some, 
some methods <laughs> um, to, um, to go to attitude uh, development um, in young people. Because when you're already a grown-up, then attitudes are not malleable anymore. But when you're young, you can still indeed, like through projects that we saw in the beginning, uh, for example, through the foyer, you can actually work uh, with young people to, to, to uh, true skills and to, to sometimes to practice. Um, and to working with each other to, to actually uh, form, form those attitudes. And then we really have some, some pedagogical techniques too, uh, uh, referring to um, deliberation in the classroom, like structured academic controversy, where you have to take the opposite stance as maybe your own stance that you believe in. So, for example, you, can, you might have to take an extreme right standpoint when you're extremely to the left, just to be able to understand or to argue for the extreme right viewpoint. And being able to understand something that is so far away from you makes that you're often not stuck in conflict, but you, that you can indeed move on to maybe more respect and more tolerance uh, towards each, each other. And that you also uh, are able to, yeah, to move to the best option for the democracy of the future. Because yeah. I also think we look at democracy as something sometimes as something very fixed, but mm -hmm. I also heard, heard you and, and explaining about how laws of the future actually are, are not fixed, but they are open to interpretation and should be open to interpretation. And I indeed agree that democracy is evolving too, and young people are actually striving to, um, to, ev yeah, to make it evolve. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's actually interesting, because in the Netherlands there's sort of a tradition of having uh, debating tournaments where people are assigned a position. Mm -hmm. So they can't choose which position they have, but that forces them to sort of think of what would be an argument for a position that they might not necessarily have. So that would be an example of what you just uh, said, that really forces people to have another position. Uh, interesting. Uh, let me go to you, Isabella. Um, you were part of the uh, My New Europe project. Um, what is your new Europe? How, what should it look like? Uh, what are some of the things that we can easily uh, lose in Europe and how do we have to evolve as Europe? What are your ideas on that subject? Thank you. Uh, yes, that's right. I was part of my new uh, Europe project. Um, and the project I talked about then was uh, Vlogging Academy. I would like to uh, say a few words about it because it's a responsible content project that we created exactly when uh, the pandemic hit in 2020. Uh, we created the first Vlogging Academy for young people, for youngsters who designed vlogs on European topics, uh, who talked about European values and posted these videos on their YouTube channels or TikTok accounts. And this was followed also by other projects in, in which we uh, learned, for example, to use Discord uh, for workshops that tackled uh, online bullying, for example, and uh, the list uh, could continue as well. But when I think of education, I have in mind a narrative that I would like to share with you. If, for example, for 10 years we give a child a monthly amount of money to do what he wants, someone should consider that uh, we have done him a favor because we have financed him or her. But if in these 10 years we convert that amount into projects and programs in which the child is involved or guide him or her on uh, how uh, this child could use that money effectively, then this will be the education that will help the person in the long run. And about my new Europe, I would like to point out briefly something about Romania as well, because mm -hmm. once our actual president took office, he launched a program called Educated Romania. But unfortunately, this program consists in uh, providing isolated in, and insufficient help to the educational system. And it is no longer enough to equip, equip a school with technological equipment, but I think that it's necessary to teach the generation to effectively use uh, that equipment. That's why my present and future Europe is one in which education is done on a long-term basis, in which investments are made in learning, first of all, in soft and hard skills, but in a sustained way. My new Europe is also one in which political leaders are inspiring people, 
and social actors understand that learning and progress through education happens over time and not just through a single law or action that we do in isolation. And I believe that my ideal Europe is one of collaboration and exchange of Europe, uh, exchange of experience, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, because we are talking about Europe and the future of it. Yeah. And this ideal Europe is uh, one in which more and more young people go to international training programs, learn other languages, experience different cultures, volunteers, and get involved. Um, and if I'm thinking about something that we should give up, I think that it's time to give up bottomless forms, projects that are made only to uh, check something, to quantify a number of people that are attending an event. We need to measure the impact more, uh, more than the volume. Uh, and in this multinational context, we need to learn to be more tolerant and to experience each other's cultures. The best education uh, and something that we promote at Station Europe is the one we get by experiencing, by um, learning by doing, so that this entire European environment should increasingly favor this international uh, and European exchange, as I said. I am happy and I want to see more and more young people who understand the power of networks in this ecosystem of civic transformation. I think that where there are many, the power increases, and when uh, yeah. where there are many but they are different, learning is stimulated. I would like to conclude by saying that from my point of view, the new Europe I want is the one in which uh, young people are no longer looking for outside influence, but the influencers are themselves, the ones who create, who pass on and send messages in their communities. Great learning uh, must start from the individual to individual and be supported by strong structures uh, at the institutional level within which they can manifest uh, themselves. Hmm. That's uh, very interesting. Something that uh, Isabella touched on, uh, Brian, was the fact that uh, good education, uh, it, it's easy to say that we want good education, but it's sometimes very hard to deliver on. It, it's challenging in practice. Uh, if you just sort of uh, look at the situation, what are some crucial points in your opinions? What trends do you see for the future? Okay, what uh, we haven't touched on and what I think that we should reflect on when uh, talking about good education is uh, the, the process. Uh, Ellen mentioned this a bit uh, about the different methods used, but we haven't discussed uh, inequality and who is... Uh, who is involved in the activities. So for example, we've discussed a lot about the importance of discussions, and we know that this is critical for learning political engagement. Uh, but who is discussing in the classroom? Is it the same uh, middle class white uh, boys? Probably these are the ones who are typically uh, found within our research to be dominating uh, the discussions. Uh, and profiting the most from uh, uh, this in terms of developing their political efficacy uh, and their possibilities for future political engagement. Uh, from our research, we know that if you come from a disadvantaged background and you're given the chance or helped and given the skills to be able to discuss, this can compensate uh, and help you to learn the, the same as uh, uh, people from more advantaged backgrounds. Uh, but we do worryingly see in recent research uh, done on classroom discussions that girls have a hard time and not always respected when they speak. And we've seen that this has a, a it reduces sometimes the levels of political efficacy. <laughs> so these are new findings that we've found from recent research. And although we think we're very gender equal now, we, I think that we need to go back and look to see and observe what's going on in all our classroom discussions, whether whether it's formal education, non-formal education, and who is uh, dominating the floor? How are other people reacting? Are they respectfully listening? As a, a, a teacher or as a youth worker, how can you get the other people who are speaking less in the room? What can you do? And I think that this is really important going forward that we try to check that everybody is going forward together yeah. in this and it's not just uh, the most advantaged. I, I, think, no. I think this is actually, <laughs> I'm going to come to, to you, I definitely, <laughs> yeah. I just want to highlight something, because I think what you're saying is absolutely fascinating. Essentially, you're saying that discussions are dominated by boys, and primarily white boys, so essentially traditional norms, if you will, are established in the classroom at a very early age. 
Yes, this is what we uh, still see in the research, the quantitative research at the yeah. moment is this. Uh, and, uh, well, to be honest, I don't even need to do quantitative research. I can see it in the classrooms at my university. Yeah, this uh, <laughs> exactly. still, still is the case. So yeah. we have some work to, to do on this, and I think it's one of the most important points uh, going forward. The practice validates the theory. Yes, Ellen, go yeah, ahead. Um, and, and then, yeah, I, think, I think, and that's why it's important that we as educators are aware of this. And we can work with this, and we also uh, make sure that teachers can. And, uh, yeah, Abir, you wanted to yeah, react I, to like this. Like, there's well? two points I want I want to talk about. Like, I, I'll just start with this one. I'm fascinating and amazing what you, what you just said. And yes, we like n having research is beautiful. So you can go somewhere and tell, hey, you need to change something. But it's like obvious. We all can see. M be my, me by myself, coming from a like a. Mm, multicultural background, let's say. Um, it's something I always experience, and especially when it comes to decision making, then you have this very small of group at, of advantage people who, who then do the decisions, then do the laws, again, to my topic. And, um, and, this, um, and these like, outcome is always not, not, not always, but like the chance that they will be not inclusive or not um, taking um, um, taking care of everyone, let's say, or everyone's um, to everyone's benefit is quite high. That's why we need a, what you said, diversity. I would I, I would just call it so. In the legal uh, field, we founded in, in Germany, we founded the Multicultural Lawyers um, Network to work especially on this problem, because we need people from different backgrounds with different education, maybe not like, not, um, like different educational paths too, and different cultural and um, language background to put, to, to, to get more and more opinions, more and more um, um, views in a decision-making process so we can benefit the most out of it because, and then I get back to you, we need this uh, this this um, agility. We need to be agile. We need to be flexible in order to make this change happen. And okay, my second point would be: we talk about all the time about education of young people. Why don't we talk about? And here is that comes the crazy futurist in me. Why don't we talk about the education of older people? Like I. <laughs> Agree. So we need to educate. Like now, I mean, it took me it took me a lot a while to to switch off my lawyer's brain and be creative. Actually, it took me a long. Although I was always creative, but when it comes to legal thinking, I was oh my god, so strict. And I see this strictness or like one way thinking in a lot of people. And this this way of thinking d does not allow us to make change possible because. In our brains, we don't see change as possible. So maybe we could have classes for people like from 40 on, like on creativity or like uh, agile thinking or futurism, for example, <laughs> which is my favorite topic. Um, like something like this, we should think about it. And then that they got get taught by the young the young yeah. people what is possible who haven't been so long time on this earth. And I love the picture you just uh, painted. And it was actually Max in his opening statement who actually talked about having workshops uh, at corporations to develop uh, civic education in adults. So that was actually a point which leads into your point as well. Um, let me sort of get to the central question here, because we're talking about the future of citizenship education. And I think the question at some point becomes, uh, how uh, can citizenship education promote uh, democracy, democratic norms, democratic attitudes, but also make society more just, more sustainable? It's a very open question, but there are a lot of people here focused basically on citizenship education. What needs to be done to make essentially it more effective in creating a better world? Is there anybody who would like to go first in answering that? Admittedly, very, very broad question here. Yes, yes Max. Um, I can draw from my opening statement here very much and elaborate more because I still believe that for one, the outreach, the very broad outreach is super important, especially in the adult population, but also the youth population, as we've heard, there's still big problems in the education there. And the activation, kind of the motivation of people to get active themselves, because then 
citizenship education will kind of grow exponentially. If I teach a class full of 10 people and they, of those five people are actually going to get engaged, they again can uh, go to people, get in touch with new people, et cetera, et cetera. I think especially for the changes, challenges that we're facing right now of sustainability, of democracy, the outreach is even more important to meet as many people as possible and convince them of the values that we want to uphold. Because problems like sustainability and democracy are both problems of great measure. Uh, to have a sustainable planet, we can't just have a few activists running around from Fridays of Future and telling us that we should go vegan. Sure, that helps, that shows the people what we're gonna do, but we need a whole planet to be sustainable, to become sustainable. If we just have a small population convinced by the ideas and motivated to follow through, then we have a problem because we also have a huge chunk of the population who's not doing that. Democracy is the same thing. It goes back to my story that I just told. It's, to it's great if we have this small group of, pop of people who are engaged, who are doing something, who are um, uh, getting up to become elected as members of parliament, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't help if there are still 40% of people who don't vote. I think the last European election had a vo voter's turnout of 51%, 52%. I was just in the European Parliament and they told me that. I think that's still 48 or 49 percent of people who did not vote. And that's a problem because we need all of them to make that democracy work. So again, outreach is the key here. Outreach is the key. Ellen, uh, the broad question, how can we use and how can we modernize perhaps citizenship education to tackle the big issues in society? I don't think we have to be so, so we don't have to modernize civic education. I think we have to see it as the process it is. It's uh, an interactive process between young people and, 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 and adults. And sometimes we are forgetting about the young people and we're thinking about the education and how it can be formed while young people have an idea of um, what they want for the future and for democracy and sometimes and, and that's where the inequality comes in they are not able to voice it because there are a lot of hurdles for them to take to voice it so i would um, follow abir in saying like let's try to make civic education maybe more deliberative in the sense that we, yeah, we should we should think about processes also more from using a diverse, uh, starting from a diverse interaction of diverse teachers, but also a diverse set of, of, of young people that can that that can give input because that's what civic education is actually all about, like getting to know. Uh, become um, getting to know a situation that you do not have encountered before, feeling very uncomfortable, but still working towards the best solution for everybody in the room. Yeah. And that doesn't need to be a compromise, but it can be the best solution for everybody in the room. And I think that can be a strong insight for Brian? the future. Yes, uh, I think there's two parts to it. There's one is what we can do in our everyday teaching and this is what we've referred to uh, before in terms of, you know, we know what works, open classroom climate, uh, student voice projects within school, getting young people involved in the local community, creating changes. We know this kind of action uh, works. We know they need some civic knowledge to go over this as well. So we know what works. We know we have to uh, work a bit on our practices to make sure that uh, we get all voices included. So I think this is quite solid. What we need to work on is going upwards as well, not just to uh, going out uh, around the community. We need to lobby to make sure that uh, citizenship education isn't lost in the, in the sphere where there's uh, a lot of uh, education discussions on loss of learning or we have to go back to prioritizing whatever is known as basic skills. Uh, God knows uh, there's a whole uh, can of worms involved there. But we have to uh, be sure that citizenship education isn't lost. It's hugely important and lobby for more of it and that it goes across the whole school and not just being kept to a single subject. 
and I think that a lot of uh, political work uh, uh, going on with policy makers and politicians to ensure the, uh, the long-term stability of the subject and the, the deepening of the subject is uh, critically important. Yeah. I think that's again a very interesting point because I think sometimes citizenship education is just one sort of subject and you're essentially saying make it part of every single subject that is taught at a school or at least integrate it as much as possible. Yes, uh, you know, we call it a whole school approach or cross curricular where every, because every lesson, every subject can have discussions, yeah. debates, uh, from science to math, there's always something which is possible to have a debate on uh, and a discussion. And in which case, then all these discussions count in terms of how they're done, who's speaking, who's involved. The school is critically important in terms of student voice, uh, making sure that there are formal structures that young people can make proper changes in the school, not just uh, deciding the colour of the paint on the wall, but making real important decisions on how the budget is used or which yeah. teachers are employed. Uh, and uh, also an making, voice. Yeah. yeah, and also those schools which are working with the communities uh, around them and have local uh, action projects. Yeah. Uh, fascinating. Uh, I want to get somebody else uh, involved who's been uh, uh, through a Zoom connection following the discussion. Uh, Andres Gonzalez. Uh, Andres, uh, it is uh, good morning uh, for you. How are you today? Good morning. And to, well, good afternoon, actually, to Europe. It's uh, 8 11 in the morning here in uh, Ecuador. It is what you see behind me is the place of independence in the capital city of Quito. And this is the place actually where the first uprising against the Spanish rule was uh, taking place. I, I, I'm gonna just show you. Uh, this looks wonderful. It, well, it looks peaceful right now. Uh, in the photo, <laughs> right now there's actually protests against the government. So okay. <laughs> if I show you a picture right now, it would be full of people throwing stones. <laughs> but this is actually wonderful. I like the fact that we're getting a sort of a tour of uh, uh, someplace in Ecuador. That, that That's really only possible with these types of hybrid events. So I thank you very much uh, for showing us the, that. I also want to thank you for getting up very early here today. So that is very much appreciated. You've been following the entire discussion and we want to get your viewpoints. Uh, like everyone else, I'm going to give you some time to make a statement as well, but I also want to make sure that people know exactly who you are, because you are the academic director and the board president of Politicum, which is the first trilingual private educational corporation for political education in Ecuador. And uh, uh, Dr. Gonzalez has been a high school teacher and university professor in and outside of his home country of Ecuador. Uh, Andres, as I said, you have uh, a chance to make an opening statement here as well. Well, thank you very much and uh, hello to all the panelists and I have been holding to my seat for almost uh, one and a half hours and I'm trying to say something <laughs> uh, because what uh, I, I find it extremely interesting what you're all uh, contributed to the debate. There's several points in which I agree. Um, there's a couple of points in which I uh, tend to, of course, respectfully disagree in terms of what we're seeing right now. And my message in my opening statement is that um, political and civic education are key right now, especially, and, and, and I'm very happy to hear some of the panelists say, not only students, but also in um, adults. And I think that is a very important thing. People that you know don't have necessarily uh, the chance to talk or to get to know about politics and are no longer in school or in university should get a chance to. But my message to you today is that I believe, seeing it from this perspective, that we're moving into a more global kind of uh, um, political education and a more digital political education. I do agree with all of you. There's nothing like being in person, right? I would have loved to come to Brussels. Uh, I, I, I have friends there that I might have visited, but it's not possible. And not necessarily only because of the pandemic, but also because of the resources. Not everyone has the chance to travel. Not every, I, I, I am in a country where there's difficulties of people of the periphery to travel to the uh, capital. And so all the cool seminars, all the big names in Ecuadorian politics and academia 
take place in the capital. And there's people in the south and the north and the east and the west in the Galapagos Islands that belong to Ecuador that don't get the chance to participate. And don't, they don't get the chance to participate because, believe it or not, the Galapagos Islands are a 500-euro flight away. Um, and in a country where the, where the minimum wage is 300 euros, uh, you can imagine how impossible that is. So I believe that the pandemic has given us the opportunity to see the opportunity, once again, I'm sorry, of having the virtuality as a tool of inclusion. And I don't necessarily mean on a national level. I mean it on a global level. Political, uh, we founded Political last year with um, uh, some courses on political education for Ecuadorian students. First thing we noticed, we can go out of the capital, as I said before. But I'm very happy to share with you, with all of you, that yesterday we opened our very first uh, program in Germany. So yesterday, I got to connect with five students, five German students in different places. The one was in Madrid, the other one was in Istanbul, the other one was in Groningen, the other one was, well, one was in uh, Germany, the other one was in Italy, and we made a class about um, politics being taught in different places. We took a look at the uh, press, we read the papers, and we discussed about politics in a way that I would say pre-pandemic would not have been possible because we only had the chip in our heads that we had to meet to do things. So I do, I, I do agree once again that there's nothing like the in-person meeting, but I see a lot of change, uh, a lot of chances, I'm sorry, in the digital. So I, I do disagree uh, with Max and I'm happy to see him again. We, we, we met uh, earlier this year in another panel, uh, but I'm happy to disagree in a way that I do believe digital teaching is possible with all the opportunities that it offers us. It offers us inclusion, it offers us variety. It offers us that someone like Isabella from Romania can join us in this panel or can join a class on political education being taught somewhere else. And of course, there are limits to that. I come uh, from a country in which not everyone has a laptop, in which not everyone has um, internet, and not to say many people don't even have electricity. So we cannot be absolutely inclusive. However, I just wanted to give you some, something to think about in a country, in a small country like ours, 80% of young people um, get informed via digital channels, okay? 60% uh, watch TV, 21% listen to the radio, and get this, only 18% of our young people actually grab a newspaper. So what, what am I trying to say with these numbers? That people don't get informed about politics other than being on the internet. And I think that's a very difficult, um, difficult environment. Um, I think Ellen was talking about a safe climate to, uh, for learning. And I believe that we're exposed to all these um, fake news and, and, and this amount of information that makes it very difficult to, to, to make the difference. What is a good uh, source of information and what is not? And I think that the future of political education, civic education must be global and must be digital. There's no reason why someone in the middle of South America cannot teach a class on politics to students that are all over the world or the other way around. And um, I believe that also we have to reach not only students and teachers of established um, institutions, but also those people who don't have the access or who don't enjoy the live uh, versions. There, that, that there's a big segment of the population, one of our educators here made a, made a survey of students that have, that have problems attending a class because they're being bullied or because they're shy or be and teaching them at home gives them the opportunity to be exactly in a safe environment. So what, what, what do you do with those students or even with those adults? You include them. You don't necessarily make uh, civil education a part of a class or a class that is taught somewhere. And I um, think 
so that it also depends on the teachers and on those people who day by day are in front of the Zoom, okay? And I think it's up to them to make it work. I don't believe in, 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 in oh, it doesn't work because it's not the same, which I agree to, but yesterday I had them 90 minutes with their cameras on. And after 90 minutes, I told them it's time to go. And they said, no, no, can we stay? Because there's another thing that I want to discuss. So I think it's also about teachers being capable of coping with the digital formats and coping with the Zoom. And I, of course, I, I, I make a trick, for example, and I say, whoever turns off the camera gets the extra work and everybody turns on the camera. And it's, it's very easy. You have to play along with it and you have to let the students engage. In, in, in the classes of Politicum, we have people from all different backgrounds that are being taught about European politics, about Latin American politics, that are being taught in many languages. So we had you know, a school from Chile that said, oh, can we also join you in learning about you know, Germany as an uh, academic uh, destination. I said, yeah, why not? So we have people from different parts of, of the continent being present here um, in front of their cameras, but joining a global conversation. So I believe um, that the future of this is to be global and to be digital. Of course, accompanying, and I agree with all the panelists um, that the present or the live uh, events are also important, but let's think about the other population. Let's think about someone who cannot ever in his life or her life go to Europe or even move from their town. Should they be you know, excluded from these wonderful opportunities that the virtuality gave us? No. And I want to end my opening statement with something that Abir said, that I think we have to change the culture, you know, and we have to change the chip, especially in older people, okay? Uh, traditions are good, set standards are good, but I think we have the chance now to do something different. And if we as adults or as the people 40 plus, do not move along with the changes. And I'm not saying we should all go on TikTok, no. But I'm saying everyone should embrace these changes and give the opportunity to both young and old to become aware of global um, politics or global civil education via a digital platform. I think I am a very, very big advocate, especially since yesterday, um, that everything is possible through uh, the, digi the digital channels. And I'll be more than happy to engage in the discussion with everyone. And I want to thank you for inviting me um, from you know the other side of the world to join uh, you and to share perspectives. Thank you. Andres, thank you very much. You're going to get a big round of applause for us from that opening statement. I very much appreciate you uh, saying some of the things that are, I think are incredibly important and in talking about the value that the digital space has because I think you are very much a living example of that. You're actually doing it, you're experiencing it, and I think that's wonderful to, so that we can learn from that. You mentioned that not everyone is on TikTok. Can I just ask how many people here are on TikTok, ladies and gentlemen? Can you please raise your hand? Yes, of course, Max is. Only two people are in this live audience here. Oh, three, uh, ver oh, very good. We have a third one more. V wonderful. All right. Th th that, it, it, as you said, not everyone definitely needs to be on TikTok, but it does go to show that perhaps uh, it is uh, getting harder as we get older to stay uh, uh, up to current technologies. Andres, let me switch gears for a second, because one of the other issues um, that I want to discuss with you, you are uh, very well educated in the European field of citizenship education. Um, what is different in South America, especially in Ecuador, and what can we learn from each other? What can Europe learn from the way it is done in Ecuador? Well, uh, first let me say, and maybe not everyone will know this, but we just had an election, a presidential election here in uh, April, and our candidate, who is now our president, actually won a huge portion of the young vote, which is, you know, uh, a very, very large number, over 30% of our electorate is young, very, very young, under 30. And he won because he opened a TikTok account. 
And he hired a professional, there's such things as professional TikTokers. And he hired this professional TikToker to open his account in the last week of the campaign. And that gave him the trust of the young people because this TikToker, of course, changed the image, put some red shoes, red sneakers on the president's um, uh, outfit, and he became a popular figure. So uh, I, I'm just saying it's, it's, I know it's a little bit populist, but it was something that to consider about um, what you were saying, uh, adapting to the new technology. Now, what do I see in Europe? I see in Europe a lot of institutions that are formal, that are part of the government, that are offering political education um, in a nonpartisan way, in a neutral way, like the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung, the BPB in Germany, which is actually why I got to know everyone here on NISI. And I think that in many European countries, the topic of political and civic education is more neutral. Here in Ecuador and in many countries of Latin America, it has been a way of indoctrinating people into the government's opinion. That's actually the, the, the topic of my panel tomorrow. But we see countries in which they use the term political education to convince them of the idea that the government is always right. So we had our fair share here of uh, governments that use the term and misuse the term actually um, in order to indoctrinate young people into revolutionary ideas. Tomorrow I'm gonna to talk about Venezuela uh, where Nicolás Maduro and his uh, predecessor, Hugo Chavez, used the entire apparatus to convince the young people of the socialist project, be that good or bad, that's another discussion, but they used programs called civil education and political education in order to get the masses on their side. And I think that is a problem. I think that's one of the differences that there, we have. Excuse me, sorry that I Europe. interrupt you, uh, Andres. Is there something we can uh, learn from the way uh, things are going in Ecuador? Yeah, I think that the, the, the big lesson here is that political education should be something neutral. You have to show the students both sides, the, 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 the right side, the left side, up, down, whatever. I think it has to be broad. It has to be a, in, in many uh, subjects. Also, one thing that people don't know here in the region, uh, Abir is a, is a lawyer, for example, and, and it would be very interesting to know how many people know their rights, how many people know what their rights are and where to find them. And so I believe that the lessons we can learn from Europe is that it is more established, it has more tradition, it has more funding. Here, no one funds you for that. No one funds <laughs> you for political education. And I'm amazed that in, in Europe, in Germany, in the case where I've been working with, that they are actually willing to fund it. That's why we're going to build up a politicum in Germany so that we can also be a part of the network. Thank you very much, uh, Andres. We very much appreciate it. Uh, we could literally listen to you for hours because you have a fascinating uh, way of speaking. And I totally see why uh, over Zoom uh, uh, people are listening from you to you all over the world. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for getting up early. We had a technical rehearsal, ladies and gentlemen. It was 3.40 a.m. in the morning for Andres and he was uh, still here. So let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> We uh, want to get through sort of the last question here in the panel, and then uh, there is also some room for people here and people online to ask questions. Uh, but let's sort of look into our crystal ball. Let's pretend there's a crystal ball here. Let's take a look at the future. And if, imagine if we are uh, looking at the year 2030. Uh, what could be the major challenges in education, in uh, democracy, in society? Uh, what are the challenges that people then will be confronting? Uh, you can pick one if you like. Again, it's a broad question, it's an open question, but we'd love to get your perspective on it. And uh, given the fact that you are a legal futurist up here, it just makes complete sense to give you the floor as the first one here. Obviously, thank you. <laughs> no, um, um, like, <clears throat> I love this question. So I would pick uh, democracy because I have no clue about education. So uh, I would pick just democracy but it ha because it has to do with like how governments works and, and our, our uh, national states. And the biggest challenge I can see is the disruption from the side of um, uh, decentralized governance, which is blockchain-based. Uh, this is something which is 
like could be, could be happening. I don't know, it's a chance. Uh, there is a chance that more and more people go into a blockchain somehow and um, vote over a blockchain and govern themselves. There is a technology which, which makes this possible, which is on the long term, 2030, could disturb the way we see democracy. And the, I mean, democracy is just our definition um, in Europe or in Germany, for example, or in, in, here in Belgium. Um, this is one definition of democracy, but, but we have, uh, for example, the Swiss definition of democracy, which is like um, direct democracy. So we could have uh, like an upload, of, like a, an upgrade. a upgrade of that in a decentralized democracy. Hmm. Uh, this could be, I don't know, it's just something I'm, I'm curious. If I look at this ball, it could be something. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah it absolutely. is. <laughs> I think, yeah, that, like you're this, completely this right. Like think the technology and all this, uh, yeah. like, like the disruptive character of technologies we're going to face. I, yeah. I'm, I don't know, it's just like uh, something we could look at. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Um, Max, uh, what do you think people in 2030, what challenges are they going to be facing? I'm a little bit more pessimistic than that, I'm sorry. Uh, I think there are going to be two major challenges, from what I know at least, and how I can judge it, and that is for one being the implementation of actual climate policies. By 2030, we have to have done something. Um, went out of the coal industry, um, maybe abolished cars that still use diesel or gas, Whatever we might have done, there has to have been an implementation of climate uh, law. But 2030 will not be the time where we will um, experience the huge consequences. We will not have uh, water levels rising by two meters or anything. So we will have the strict laws, but we won't have um, experienced all the different consequences. And I think this will be a cause for great unrest for um, big disagreements within society because people will not have seen the direct conse consequences of why they have to maybe um, live without something or have had changed their lifestyle. The second big challenge that I see in 2030 is further conflicts within, uh, on an international level. We have China rising to power, we have Russia trying to reclaim old uh, strength and I think the wars of tomorrow will not be fought on some battlegrounds with tanks and everything, but they'll be similar to Cold Wars. And in this day and age, there will probably be some kind of information warfare. There won't be any soldiers in Germany or in the EU or in Belgium or anything. What we rather will see happening are hackers, hackers infiltrating our groups, um, trying to change public opinion, trying to spread public dissent so that our society actually begins to crumble and with that our democratic system so that the whole um, opponent that we might be to someone is weakening. I think it's our task as citizenship educators specifically in those two, ta in those two challenges to step in and help the public reaffirm its uh, values to stay true to the systems that we value such as democracy. Bryony, what are the challenges that you see coming in 2030? Okay, well, I would say it in a different way. I would say that we're seeing even the effects of climate change right now, and uh, I, I don't think that this is, things are going to get better in this direction immediately, even if we suddenly have a, a miracle and everybody really goes for it, uh, the, or the governments go for it. And I think that we have to be prepared at least to, and hope for better, but at least to be prepared for uh, difficult times. Uh, I mean, there are already uh, wars happening over resources like for water, uh, for uh, basic needs, uh, and um, we're going to see already, there are already fires, floods. We're going to get migration, more migration as a result of this. Uh, and we do know that the challenges are that when we, uh, well, it's been shown over many years that when you're in a situation of survival, it, it's usually your tolerance and uh, 
equality, things like this, which go down. So we have to be uh, mindful and that we're really working on equality, really working on tolerance, really working on respect, because these might be areas which uh, probably not the worst in the younger generation, probably more uh, difficult in the older generation. But uh, yeah, if we're going to be in challenging times, then we need to make sure that we don't revert back to uh, making sure I'm okay where I live uh, and building a fortress uh, coming from the UK. Yeah. <laughs> building a fortress with lots of borders <laughs> that we try to uh, avoid doing this and we try to build uh, a, a world uh, yeah, yeah. Of, of young people who can uh, keep the values of uh, tolerance, respect, equality and uh, try to uh, keep these ideas afloat. Thank you. Isabella, the challenge is in 2030. What do you see coming? Yeah, uh, when, when you said 2030, I immediately thought of goal four, quality education and the 2030 agenda and the UN sustainable development goals. So I think that this is a very good benchmark uh, to refer to when imagining the future. Um, I will speak strictly from a digital point of view and from a communicational point of view, looking at how much the pandemic has uh, deepened communication differences in the online environment and beyond how radicalization has gained ground and also misinformation has competed somehow with scientific facts uh, and true, uh, true news opposite to fake news. I think the biggest challenge of the coming years is precisely uh, balancing uh, of the online, the, uh, the tampering, I, I may say, of this field, which unfortunately is not only one in which you can and we can create good campaigns, but it is one in which anyone can say almost anything. And this creates an unprecedented information war. And also this may lead to uh, rethinking a little bit uh, democratic values. I think I also have to say something f uh, first about the power of the digital space that was discussed uh, earlier. I remember in, in uh, university Briefly, that- please. Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, we learned that digital space is a continuation of the physical one, and that's why the democracy should not end where internet starts. I think that this is a very good point. And also 2030 can look in many ways, depending on some decisions we make now. It can be an apocalyptic, apocalyptic year, I'm sorry, uh, because of the misinformation that should continue um, if maybe social networks do not introduce clear security mechanism and so on, and in individuals will uh, continue to uh, be in conflicts because of their differences and not embrace that openness uh, that Andres was talking about. And also this year can be an excellent one if we start to create more posts on positive messages, we start to collaborate together organizations and create good campaigns and also uh, we can uh, just join forces and do something now because I think that uh, it is the right time. So this is a very complex subject, but for me and for us, it's very useful to look at the sustainable development goals and to start acting um, in uh, relation to those. Thank you, Isabella. And to uh, conclude it, and then before we go to the questions from the audience, Ellen, uh, the, the, the major challenges you see coming in 2030, looking into your crystal ball here. Yes, I, I think a lot of a lot uh, has been said already. Um, on my list, uh, definitely was inequalities, and I think inequalities also due to climate change. And what has been said about the potential of the digital world, I also think there is a potential uh, looking into these inequalities. But indeed, also following Isabella, do we want digital populism to save democracy? I don't think we want that, so we should also think about um, how we deal with this digital world um, regarding civic education. Okay, thank you very much for looking into your crystal ball. Uh, we're going to look nine years from now, we're going to reconvene this panel and see if it came true. Uh, undoubtedly, that's the case. Uh, but let's see if there are questions uh, from the audience. If people here have a question, then you can raise your hand. Online, questions already have been submitted. Uh, so we'll get a, a mix of both questions from the live and the uh, virtual audience. I see a hand going up right here in the front on the second row. If we can get a microphone 
to you, which is indeed coming. You can ask your question to the panel. Now, one, uh, we have about 10 minutes uh, for these uh, answers, so if, if you try to keep them brief, we can keep in as many as we can possibly get in. Yes, your question, ma'am. Uh, my name is Alicia Pacevic. I am coming from Poland, and I'll be short. Um, though I'm angry, I'm frustrated. I'm coming from a country where uh, young people have to train themselves to the building of the Ministry of Education and where young women and men who participated in the march against climate change or for women's rights are now sued in the courts. So um, to make um, my, 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 my message very short, I would like to build upon what Bryony was saying, that we really can't rely on um, you know, processes you know, that are floating, interactive processes and things that are happening, or magic outreach. This will not happen unless we really uh, uh, find some way to lobby for citizenship education also on European level. And in the, um, the situation like we have in Poland, yes. in Hungary, maybe also in uh, Slovenia, uh, that we had in Ecuador, but I think that we need a very strong here voice on that this world in which we live in is yeah. shaped by citizens. Exactly. And not, you know, biologists, cameramen or yeah. educators. So we all need it. Exactly. I Sorry. think that's a great point. No, I think it's actually a great point. <laughs> yeah. I think it deserves applause, especially uh, your situation from Poland. We all know what happened there. So I think this is a very important statement that you just made, and I want to thank you for doing that. Uh, are there any other questions, comments, suggestions, anything else from uh, people here in the room? In that case, yes. All right, there's one in the back, and then there are also a couple of questions from our virtual audience. Uh, yes, sir, your question. If you could stand up so we can see you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, I'm Patrick. Uh, what I miss a bit in the, in the discussion is uh, I'm, I'm convinced that there is a need on social media, but as Mr. Gonzalez uh, pointed out, put on some red sneakers and you become the next president of a country. Um, our former laughingstock of the world, uh, also known as the former president of the United States, also uh, pointed out, put some uh, messages on, on Twitter and you become the next president of the United States. That's something I missed a bit in the, in the discussion. What about uh, the young people uh, pointed out that social media, like TikTok, with the hands of uh, a communist country, uh, the danger of it um, about that. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody in the panel who wants to react? Max? This reminds me of something that I've thought earlier in the mm -hmm. discussion about digitalization. I can speak from my experience. We young people don't necessarily always see social media, Facebook, Twitter, etc., as a place of education and facts. We don't go onto Instagram and say, well, I'm going to learn something today. It's rather, um, this is entertainment for me. This is connection to other people. This is kind of a, on a social level. Therefore, it is always difficult, at least in my opinion, to learn something from Instagram. And therefore, it is so easy for people to spread this information on Instagram because I'm not fully paying attention while I'm laying in my bed, scrolling through Instagram and seeing what's going on. Yeah. That's why I, I think we should still um, draw import, importance to this point of citizenship education cannot happen just in digital space, although yeah. it needs to combat uh, trends like those within social media. Exactly. Brian, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, um, because uh, uh, we, we do this in, in our courses at university, that we bring the social media into the classroom. So we talk about how to read social media, how to create your uh, social media, how to be respectful to other people when you get a message. Uh, we have assessments where the young people have to demonstrate their own ability to communicate in a stressful way online and using social media. Uh, we have vlogs and stuff. Uh, 
So I think that the digital is very important and we do bring it into the classroom, but that's how it works. It's you, you bring it into the classroom, so you discuss it and discuss how to do it, how to create it and how to work with it. And this we think is, well, I think is an important way of uh, teaching with the digital world. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. That, okay, thank you very much. Let me get to one of the uh, virtual questions. We have a couple of them right here. Um, I, I have to. I would like to go to the next question. Uh, let me see if he wants to say something about this next question. Let me get. I think this is a fascinating question. Uh, somebody is essentially uh, positing a statement. He says, "To me, one of the most fundamental objectives of citizenship education is to develop individuals' social responsibility. Rights come with duties. Do you agree?" He's asking the panel. Is there anybody who would like to respond to that? Do people here in this panel agree with that statement? Yes, but it's not often very talked about that rights come with duties. We've seen this in, during the COVID uh, pandemic. Well, I have my rights, but I'm forgetting about my duty to protect others yeah. around me. We can definitely fix that and sh um, talk more about this. I agree. Yes. Ellen, uh, do people not have enough knowledge about the duties that they have as a citizen? Um, I I do think they, they can have more knowledge, but um, they also can have more knowledge about their rights. For example, a lot of people don't know that they actually have a lot of rights that come from the European. Uh, Europeans yeah. don't, don't, don't realize that. So I think they can be educated on both fronts. And um, yeah, rights and duties, they, they, they come together. Eh? So, <laughs> but they're not fixed, I learned today. <laughs> Exactly, and I think, uh, Abir, you talked about uh, rights and there not necessarily being enough knowledge about that as well. Let me get to another question here. What role do parents play in encouraging their children into citizenship education? We haven't really talked about the role of parents, and I think it's a good and interesting point here that's being raised. What role do parents have? Is there anybody who would like to go into that question? Brian, yes, please. <laughs> So, <laughs> oh, does he? <laughs> okay, Andres, I'm going to give you the floor. What role do parents have in this uh, process? Okay, thank you so much, and I'll be very brief. I think parents are acting somehow as gatekeepers, especially when it comes to digital content. And we have a lot of experience here in our in Politicum. We engage with the parents. We invite them to the class. We say, sit down with your kid and let's talk about your rights. Let's talk about your rights in the Constitution, of which you don't know anything of. And you're a parent. You have a kid who's 16 or who's 18 or whatever. So we engage with them. And I think that's also very important. And one thing that I wanted to add is that we have to cope with the rhythm of, uh, of, of the social media as well, in terms of letting people know through social media about their duties. 20 years ago, nobody thought about Facebook. They said to Mark Zuckerberg, it's never gonna work, and now we cannot live without it. So I think parents are gatekeepers that need to be engaged, and I believe that we have to take the pace and the rhythm of how technology is going. All right, thank you, Brian. Yes, okay, please. So Parents are crucial. We, I mean, uh, our research has shown that parents are crucial in the development of political engagement. They, this is where you have these uh, uh, home environments, usually from advantaged backgrounds, where young people at home uh, they dis yeah, have uh, discussions, uh, have uh, involved in decision making. And the question is more is how to support young people who come from a home environment where this is not the case, and that's where the school becomes crucially important. Hmm. Exactly. And could I add one thing yes. and another point? Okay, so there was a couple of questions which came up um, and something in the room to do with how to lobby. Okay, so I can give one example of what's happening in the UK, which answers the online question up there, which is an example to everybody, is that, um, there's a whole group of uh, civil society organizations who've got together and now are working together with politicians. And there is a big event on the 4th of November uh, on political literacy to lobby in order to keep citizenship education within the curriculum in the UK. So it is like a, a mass a event of a mass actors, civil society politicians, uh, people working in the universities, 
ganging up all together and lobbying the politicians and working with them to have an event on the 4th of November, which is uh, something to make sure citizenship education won't be taken out of the curriculum. Thank you. Last question here. I'm going to pass that question to you, Isabella. Um, this, I think, is uh, your uh, territory. What is the main challenge, somebody's asking, in achieving a more active European awareness for citizenship education? Well, that, uh, that's a hard question, <laughs> but I will try to uh, keep it uh, briefly. Um, I was about to say that if the time was uh, a little too uh, much permissive with us, but I think that citizenship education needs a bit of uh, better marketing right now. I think that we need to reconsider a, a little bit um, the way that we uh, communicate what is citizenship education about and this depends on the cultures we are in for example in romania we cannot say political education because political is related to something that leads to corruption so we have to think uh, about non-formal about gamification and i think that the best thing about promoting and raising the awareness is to try to uh, talk about citizenship education um, by translating the terms on the language of the generations. It's one thing to talk about citizenship education to young people and is another thing to talk about this concept to, to the parents. It's, it's always important to switch sides and to try to understand their language and to understand their uh, universe of understanding. And this is the key, to, to understand their, um, their terms, their way of um, per perceiving uh, this role of citizenship education. Yeah, and no. the dialogue can continue, but just to keep it brief, that's, that's the main uh, point, I think. Well, thank you, Isabella, and I, I appreciate you saying that, and I think that's why it's incredibly valuable to have you, as well as Max, on this panel as well, because we would like to get that young perspective, and uh, you guys uh, certainly have brought that with some very interesting thoughts, and that goes, by the way, to everyone here. I want to thank all of my panelists here. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give them a big round of applause as you guys can take your seats again. Thank you guys so much. Thank you very much. Hey, could you just tell the, person, the people from the UK to email me if they have more questions because we couldn't answer them? Yes. She's uh, saying right now, if there are people who have more questions about this topic, you can email her uh, personally, uh, and uh, she is uh, glad to answer them. Where can people find your email address, uh, Bryony? Uh, just email just Google, Google her name. <laughs> And she is more than happy <laughs> to answer the question. <laughs> yes, fair enough. All right, wonderful. Uh, thank you again, Bryony. That's uh, very kind of you to say that. Uh, we're going to be moving on to the next part uh, because there are a lot of things that have been said here today in the panel, and I would imagine that it's sort of a nice moment to reflect on that, talk about that with other people. And we're going to be doing that both uh, virtually and physically in what is called an open space and reflection groups with a coffee break. It is going to be moderated uh, by uh, uh, Susanna Ulrich, and I'm going to give her the floor as you guys give her a big round of applause. Susanna, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I don't need a crystal ball to assume that you are all longing for a coffee break. And uh, the good news is uh, an open space is a long coffee break. It's the longest coffee break ever. It comes from that uh, understanding that when in some of the conferences, the best part was the coffee break. So one guy took this uh, learning and made up with the open space format. So how many of you have been, been to an open space, to an open space format in a conference already? Let me see that. Some of you, not so many. It's great. So you will get an opportunity to, to get to know this. And I will be so brief, but speak more slowly, I assume. OK, so you get some information about the open space, and it goes like this. It's a place where people organ no? yeah. People organize themselves. You are going to organize yourself soon with topics that you want to talk about, reflection about what you have heard right now, or maybe some other things, even a project you come here to this conference you want to present, or you want to find partners, networking. Everything can happen in an open space or you just take a, top, a cup of coffee, who knows? So this is um, what is going to happen, and I'm going to explain to you four principles, 
one law and two animals. And then that's it. So the four principles. Whoever comes is the right people. So don't wait for anybody else. If there are only two people, that's the right people. If it's just you, maybe you want to sit and reflect. Maybe you go back to the coffee break and just talk to some other people. Who knows? Then the next one. Whatever happens is what could have. Don't expect whatever. Just let it happen and see what comes out of it. Let, just be inspired by the people who come. Whenever it starts, it's the right time. Yes, there are slots. There are two time slots for about 30 minutes that you will meet together in rooms out there. Yeah, I will explain that later. And then just go there. And when you're there, and then there are some people there, you just get started. And when it's over, you don't have to, when after 15 minutes you sing, we have said everything, you don't have to continue. When it's over, it's over. That's the fourth principle. The law of the two feet. The most important thing about an open space. When you feel like you're not going to contribute anymore in what is happening here, just go. That's, you're free to go. Nobody's going to be uh, thinking bad about it. Just, just go, because you might be better in another place. This is not the place you want to be. That's the open space philosophy. And the last, you could be a butterfly and you could be a bumblebee. If you're a butterfly, you might think the best thing to do is just stay in the coffee area, drink a cup of coffee and attract other people with your beauty. The, and you probably will. And then sometimes that's the best part of the conference, the moment that you meet people you haven't met before, that come, that approach you, whatever, this could happen. And as a bumblebee, you will just move from one place to the other. You stand here, you go there to go to this room, and it's all free, it's all open. That's the idea of the open space. Just do it. And I think that was the quickest introduction <laughs> to an open space I ever did. But since we didn't get the chance to stand outside where you find my open space wall to write down the topics so people will know where to go and where to find interesting topics, we'll have to do it right now and here. So take two more minutes. I, I, have, to, I have to see Zoltan, actually. I was supposed to see Zoltan. Zoltan here? Do I get him on the big technic support? Zoltan is... Here he is. Zoltan will do the same. My colleague Zoltan in Munich will do the same thing online. Do you want to address the people? Yes, please <laughs> listen to Susanne. Because she's <laughs> actually right now creating the open space, which we are going to share online uh, in Gathertown. And I'm very excited by that. And I think it's going to be a fascinating experience for everybody. So meet me there in, after Susanne finished to all the online people. Also, I think we get an idea of how this gather town looks like, right? Can we get just for a short moment to show you how people are running around there? Technique, do we get a gather town picture? Yeah. Here, here they are, yeah. Who is running? Ah, okay. So have a good time there. We say goodbye to you online and see you later in the live stream and coming back to you. Just take a moment and talk to the one person next to you, in the back, in the fourth, just wherever, maybe someone you haven't talked to so far. And just think about topics that you would like to discuss now. What will come up? Because usually when, I, when you were asked, what would you like to talk about, it's not that it's coming like this. So take a moment, two minutes, and then go to that open space wall, write that topic on the list, find a slot that you would like to be there, you will find the rooms, I will be there to assist you. And then more, most of all, enjoy the long coffee break. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Hello. Did everyone have a good coffee break? Yes. Was it a productive coffee break? Did we have good conversations? Did we meet interesting people? Is there anybody who wants to say, I did not meet an interesting person here today? <laughs> That's always a dangerous uh, thing to do here. Uh, we've actually been following the conversation online. Uh, we want to show a couple of things because on Telegram, people have been sharing some things there. Uh, in fact, we've asked people at the beginning to show us how they're following the conference. And in fact, we have been sent a couple of pictures, which we want to show you uh, because there is one satellite event taking place, which is on the next slide. Yes, if we click to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, we see a, uh, a satellite conference in the country of? Azerbaijan. Thank you. I could not pronounce that for some reason. And there are people watching us on YouTube from their own living room, which is actually quite convenient. It's probably a good way to sort of follow a conference, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say if you haven't yet joined the Telegram group, this is where half of the action is taking place. Definitely join. You can find it on the nisi.eu website. Um, and also, there is actually a very fun poll happening right there. I'm going to pull it up from my phone right now. The poll here is, do you think that citizenship education needs a makeover? 33% said totally. 67% said only in some ways. And 0% said not at all. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So a lot of people, the, the vast majority, I would even say, thinks there needs to be some changes, some perhaps modernization, mm -hmm. but they're pretty satisfied with the way things are going, which I think is a good way to look at it. Definitely, but it definitely also ties into that last discussion that we just had, where the question yeah. was what needs to happen in order to get the word out even more exactly. um, and have a different, maybe, um, recognition of citizenship education. And um, I'd be curious to know if everybody here in the room participated in the survey. If you haven't, please do head over to Telegram join that, um, and then we can maybe see if the poll has changed later on no. today, perhaps tomorrow. Um, or new yeah. polls and everything else. Exactly. exactly. Get started with the next part of the program. There's one more vital information. Uh, we've been mentioning it since this early afternoon, and we want to remind everyone here in Brussels especially, there are field trips organized, specifically dedicated to citizenship education, specifically for everyone here in the room. So if you haven't yet, and Victor and I did take a quick look, if you haven't yet, please head over before you leave today and sign up for one of those field trips. There's quite a few. We've had the Windows to Brussels, the first one, where there was an introduction of the local organizations. The next one's about to come as well. And you can actually engage with these organizations, with these individuals um, on an individual level. So we really do encourage you to take this opportunity to join these field trips tomorrow. Yes, at the registration desk, which is over there in the central hall, you can actually register for the field trip of your choice. All right, I think we've said all that needs to be said. Yes. Let's move on to the next part of the program because we're going to be doing another window to Brussels. I'm going to be moderating that. Um, I'm actually going to get a microphone here because that is what I need. We have three more organizations from Brussels here today that want to present themselves to you. And the first one is going to be presented by Veronique de Lener, and she is from the organization MUX, and she is going to be telling us all about her organization. She needs to stay seated, so that's why we're doing it slightly different for this one. But can we give a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, to Veronique. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, I'm director of Max VZW, and Max VZW is working since mostly 22 years in very poor neighborhoods in Brussels, named Gurigem and Molenbeek. Um, we have community centers in both neighborhoods and um, in these neighborhoods we are living together with almost 110 nationalities. Um, many uh, people doesn't have a job and 50% of the inhabitants have only a primary school level. 
we have a rate of 33% unemployment on adults and mostly 52% of youth unemployment. What we try to develop is uh, working with the digital competence centers. Give computers to people. We want to work with people and use digital methodology to give people a chance to talk about social, social problems. Um, most of our clients, youngsters and older people, are convinced that Belgium state uh, treats them as a second rank citizen. So we want to turn this on and give them the weapons to become a uh, first rank citizen. And that means that when they can use a computer and, for example, uh, uh, send, have a contact or a chat with the mayor, they can make a digital story about the problems in their neighborhood. Uh, we do a lot of those things, even with people who never touched a computer. Sometimes we work also with seniors who can talk about memories uh, and uh, give these memories in a little movie to youngsters where we can talk about which lessons that they can take about this. Um, uh, we have two big uh, projects. Eh? Um, I didn't, uh, I, I'm not, I don't have the time to show you uh, the little movies, but I will tell you something. And tomorrow, uh, if people are interested, they can come to the field trip where they can do uh, and participate at a workshop on digital storytelling. So what is a digital story? A digital story is a little film of two, three minutes where you work with a voiceover and with still images. And it's easy, people, tomorrow we will use an iPad to make a story. And the purpose of this story is to bring, to, it's a kind of give a call to action about a problem that is important for you. So this was, for example, uh, we did a project with illiterate adults. Um, and we showed them the Charter of the Human Rights and they had to choose a story, a personal story, about how they feel about the Charter of the Human Rights. Eh? Uh, this man was telling that he was looking for a job but he couldn't read and write and so uh, it was very difficult for him to find a job. Um, we did also a project about prevention of radicalization with youngsters here the same. We, did, uh, we uh, asked people, uh, parents, uh, who, who the children were going to Syria to come into the classroom and tell something. And then we asked their opinion. Eh? Uh, in our neighborhoods, many uh, youngsters are from Muslim origin. So we, it was very interesting to talk with them. And also many youngsters from this neighborhood also went to Syria. Uh, we have another program and that is called Capital Digital. And uh, there we work with 15, 18 year, year old youngsters. Um, there is a problem in Brussels. Those youngsters want, they live in very di difficult uh, circumstances and they absolutely want to find a job. So what we propose to them is that they follow a training as coding animator and then they can work as a, a student job to give courses to children. And we see that it works a lot on self-esteem uh, it were because they become the master of coding in the neighborhood. Eh? And the children are telling them, oh, sir, can you tell me this? Can you tell me this? And they are 15 years old. I, I received a phone call from some parents who told me, uh, what did you do to my son? Because now there is no red anymore in the, uh, uh, the report of the schools. And I asked the children, uh, the youngster, what is happening? Say, you know, I was teacher during a time, and those children, they, did, they didn't want to listen. So when I was the teacher, and I was thinking, but I do the same in the classroom. So it was a positive. So for the people who are interested in this program, we also organize uh, tomorrow 
uh, this field trip where we can learn much, much more about this capital digital uh, program and you can even learn a little bit to code. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you can uh, keep it for one second. I think this is uh, fascinating uh, what you've just uh, discussed. And I think this morning in the panel discussion, we talked about how uh, digitalization can really be uh, uh, an, an, an added value uh, to helping uh, people learn civic skills. But we forget sometimes that there are a lot of people who are not digitally literate. And so you are essentially helping people become more digitally literate. Yeah, uh, but we, we always do it together with social problems and citizenship. Yeah. And that is the most important because, for example, when we talk with these illiterate adults, those people told us, I'm not able to make this story. And who is interested in my voice? Yeah. Uh, and with this digital story, we can work on two points. Exactly. The workshop you just uh, explained uh, what's going to be happening, the field trip uh, tomorrow there, if you had to give people definitely a reason to go to your organization, if you had to persuade them, what, what argument would you give them? I think uh, we are all uh, busy with digital education, uh, but at the same time, this citizenship and digital education, you know, digital methodology is a very easy yeah. to use in citizenship. Because before, when you wanted to make a film, it was, it cost a lot of money. Definitely. Eh? Now everyone can make something on an iPad. And so I think social work and uh, work with adults and youngsters should more and more use this digital methodology to work on the team of citizenship. This is a great pitch. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have another big round of applause? Thank you so much. Veronique Lehner, thank you so much. I'll take the microphone for you and I'll take the clicker. Thank you. All right, let me put this up there for the next speaker. I can put this away. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's give her a big round of applause because our spec second speaker is from FMDO. Her name is Jade Hornard. Yes. The clicker is right there, and there is a presentation that's ready for you whenever you are. Uh, okay, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for the invitation. My name is uh, Jade, and I work for the Brussels based nonprofit organization FMDO, uh, which has a main focus on the super diversity of, uh, of the city. So I'll give you um, in the short presentation following an idea of who we are, um, our mission, and how we are trying to achieve it. Um, we need to go back a little bit in time uh, for the origins of our organization, which is in the 90s. Um, we um, officially are, were created in 95, but we need to go back to 91. Um, I tell it because it's important to understand why we do what we do. Um, because in 91, we had an election here in, uh, in um, Belgium, um, and we call that day the Black Sunday or Zwarte Zondag, because the extreme right uh, party here, people uh, might remember, uh, won uh, the election then and um, as a reaction many people with migration backgrounds they uh, decided to um, to gather they created associations or even federations of associations and one of them was FMDO or the Federation of the Moroccan Democratic Organizations um, so that is the start we are of course now 2021 and many evolutions happened um, today the M of Moroccan is not anymore um, standing for Moroccan but for Mondial or global um, because we have member associations now of uh, people all over the world um, another evolution is that we also now work together or our associations but also through different projects with uh, many local um, governments on projects based on um, super diversity, on integration, on citizenship. Um, and the third evolution is that we not only in Brussels are doing that, but um, all over Flanders um, by today. Uh, we have a team now with people with, from uh, different backgrounds of 22 people, um, 200 member associations, uh, and many, many volunteers. Um, our mission then um, is, um, first of all, connecting people uh, with and without migration background. Um, secondly, creating a, a warm society, um, a society where people can feel at home, can express themselves and uh, their cultural identity uh, freely with the main goal of um, making the power of super diversity visible. And then thirdly, we want to create 
safe spaces for minorities that also their voices can be heard and they can uh, fully uh, participate in, uh, in the society as, uh, as active citizens. Uh, so this is history theory. Uh, how are we trying to do this or how are we trying to uh, achieve uh, our mission? Um, first of all, I'm going to go to connecting people and then I keep my, uh, um, my structure. Um, connecting people, um, we think that this is the start, making people meet each other, making different cultures meet each other um, uh, in real life so that ideas in your head or prejudices um, might, might change. Um, doing that, we always try to focus on what connects people, on shared interests, on shared uh, talents and so on. Uh, so for example, food is a very easy one. Um, our associations, they organize um, cooking workshops. They cook traditional recipes from their culture. People can come, learn about the food, about the culture, get to know each other very informally, and this can already create beautiful conversations. Um, also on the picture, you see our open house Marceline. There we organize, this is in Ostende. Um, also many workshops and some projects, for example, uh, based on poetry, on literature, people with and without migration background um, with an interest in literature or poetry share, um, share this from their country, getting conversation about it and actually we, by focusing on what people share also, um, it's a very nice way of uh, bringing people together. I'm gonna go back now <laughs> for the following. Uh, making the power of super diversity visible. Um, this will link to our mission of creating a warm society. We do this mainly by um, sharing positive stories. For example, um, through an expo, you can see the picture on the left, um, via a podcast, we are writing stories in some uh, journals here in Belgium. So really um, sharing positive stories, not mainly what you see about migration in the news, but the positive side of it, which is a Definitely the, the biggest one. And then thirdly, uh, and I think the, the one most uh, yeah, interesting for here, reinforcing the participation in, in society of people with a migration background. Uh, this we, we link to the safe spaces for people to, to be active and to participate. Um, two examples uh, are uh, ambassadors projects where we really um, use or give a space to people with migration background. Um, to here, for example, um, act in, uh, in schools as an intermediate in between newcomers and uh, the schools to inform newcomers' parents. Uh, another picture you can see is of a project with, uh, vo with newcomers uh, who are linked to organizations as volunteers, so people who just come and are not ready to work yet but can uh, do volunteer work to already um, yeah, have a positive experience, can share their talents and uh, get to know people as well. Um, I'm going to leave it here. Um, we, um, yeah, this is only a teaser of what we do. As I said, we have 200 associations with all their own agenda. We have more than 20 different projects um, in Brussels and Flanders. So um, I'll all uh, invite you to come to our field trip uh, tomorrow to, to get to know our organization better, to visit our website. And uh, I'm here if people have a some more questions. Stay Thank there, you. Stay there. Let's give her a big round of applause, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like the idea. I mean, I think the idea of giving a workshop, a cooking workshop, and it sort of brings people together. I think that's sort of the power that food can have in society. Definitely. It does bring people together, yeah, and especially definitely. if it's something difficult and you mess up or you create something especially beautiful, whatever happens, you bring people together. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. a lot of fun. Okay, we definitely want to talk about the field trips because I think uh, they're, they're going to be fascinating. Who has not been to Brussels before this particular day? New in Brussels, yes, okay. A couple of people, this is your first time in Brussels. Do you like it so far? He loves it, okay, that's good. Your field trip is actually going to allow people to explore Brussels very well. Definitely, for people who've never been here, but even for people who know the city very well, uh, I think it might be very interesting because we're gonna take you through a, a personal guiding tour with our volunteer guides, people with migration background, and they'll take you to a, 
their favorite spots in Brussels, uh, how they have experienced it, what it means for them. They link it also to their um, home country and will uh, yeah, give you a tour you cannot book uh, elsewhere than uh, with FMDO. So so we're <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of uh, enthusiasm for that in, in, in this room. So essentially we're not going to the Atomium and all the standard things. We're going to None special locations that only somebody who has really deep knowledge of the city could know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that that's that's a high bar for promoting the field trip but there's a, a third person who's going to be promoting a field trip as well so we're going to see if that's going to be top but let's give her a big round of applause ladies and gentlemen jade hornard thank from you. fm deo thank you all right as and then indeed we can give a big round of applause to the next person from the house of european history eva gutman ladies and gentlemen yes she deserves a big round. thank you Thank you so much. It's a great, great pleasure to be here today. Uh, I think, I mean, one of the challenges of giving this uh, late afternoon talk, early evening talk, is of course um, not knowing, you know, what attention spin we have left here. But we had a long uh, coffee break, so I hope nobody dozes off. Only those who take a nap uh, can be those ones who already heard about my work. So I will try to make it as engaging are as these possible. These people are as fresh as they are ever are. They just had coffee. <laughs> they have been drinking way too much coffee, so they're incredibly alert, in fact. Okay, <laughs> so I set the stage. Um, so my name is Eva Goodman. I'm uh, a head of uh, learning and outreach at House of European History. One of the great pleasures to be here is um, to show how diverse the city is. Diverse uh, work that we're doing, diverse linguistically, socioeconomically, um, in terms of political views, backgrounds we're coming from, and even though I it's a great pleasure to be with all my colleagues from Belgium who work, and I'm full of admi admiration. It also brings us to the next level to show us what we try to do when we try to say who we are as Europeans. And I think that's a great example where we are positioned as a house of European history, because I couldn't imagine a better location uh, to talk about this, what we're trying to do at the house. So I don't know how many people are familiar with our museum or saw our exhibition before. So I might just give you a quick background, how this all started and what is the main mission and what we try to accomplish. So the project was actually initiated by a former president of European Parliament, Mr. Pottering, and he started um, thinking about conceptual basis with several different um, uh, groups and, and influential thinkers. Uh, how could we exhibit um, history of Europe without being patronizing and polarizing, but in a way that makes us feel we have a lot of in common, we have a lot of indifference, uh, and we want to continue discovering together what it is that we have in common or what divides us. So um, as you can see, the project um, took quite a while. So it started, the initial conversation started in 2017, and, it, uh, and then it opened in 2017. So almost a decade of um, historians, museologists, uh, people from all over Europe that came and were developing the conceptual basis for the house. So the museum opened, and right now we are still quite young institution on, on Brussels uh, landscape. Uh, and what we are trying to do is to present uh, European history from transnational perspective, not from the national context, not from the national point of views, uh, but we talk all about big processes that happen in Europe, such as democracy, such as slavery, such as Holocaust, anything that is somehow part of our common heritage, so to say, and trying to show it again how, that, how did it look in the northern part of Europe and continent, southern, east, and west? So the way the exhibition is um, developed and, and designed is that we use multimedia. We have six floor when we go through different thematic and what we call milestones of European history, what was happening, uh, let's say, from the 19 centuries, from revolutions through different developments, and then first and second world wars, so main conflicts that we went as a continent. Um, so we are then reaching the point that we try to define uh, what we want to really focus on, what is the main focal point of, of our objects, of our learning programs, of things that we try to show to visitors, and we focus on the processes that we feel they originated in Europe, so they are originally processes that were somehow developed 
on, so to say, European continent, although this even we put under question because we don't know how to define the borders because the borders are constantly switching and changing. So we try to define what geographically mean, Europe means. The processes that spread all around the uh, continent and the processes that are still relevant today. So these are the processes that we are discussing today human rights issues, democracy, civic engagement, involvement, conflict resolution, and how do we collaborate and participate in our democratic processes uh, in the continent. Then it comes closer to my scope of work. So um, we're all masked here, but I wore the same top, so you can see this is us. <laughs> This is my team when we were out, uh, in and out of lockdown. Now the team is enlarged, so we're up to 12 people. So we'll have some new colleagues, hopefully, that we will be meeting in person because we're still a mix of teleworking and, and being in the office. So as a learning team, uh, we are a group of uh, diverse people also from different backgrounds and different languages, historians, art historians, museologists. Um, and we deliver programs in four languages here in, in Brussels. So we have, I will show you a little bit uh, examples of what programs we have. Uh, but we also develop materials and online resources that, and, that are then translated into 24 languages. So there's basically everything that we develop for people who can access it digitally is translated into 24. So our reach from the very beginning is thinking about, again, everybody who can reach us in different countries that might not be able to come to Brussels and visit us physically. What we try to, some of the guiding principles, how we try to develop programming, how we try to engage either with students or teachers or other target groups that we're working with, uh, is to help to develop key uh, critical thinking uh, skills. Um, Self-reflection, we try not to have a very top-down pedagogical approach, we just want to present multiple perspectives show that we can see history maybe a little bit different than what we were taught as yeah, high school students or even students at the universities because I studied history and what I was taught at some of my courses was very different than my Dutch colleagues or my Belgium colleagues were uh, taught in the university um, classes. So we try to show those different uh, multiple, multiple perspectives and we try to encourage ongoing dialogue. So again, for me, actually, when visitors come, I feel more accomplished when they leave with more questions than answers when they leave the building, because that means we triggered something that they either will come back or they will pose those questions further wherever they are coming back and will be reflecting about it. Something that I think is close to the teams that we're discussing here in, in this setting is our uh, online resources that were developed for, for teachers, but also for edu informal educators or educators that work in different um, uh, social services and settings. Is, uh, we have thematic approach, so we, uh, we talk about things like migration, conflict, human rights, information technologies, which I would say it's probably more like media literacy. So we do talk also about things that we were trying to discuss today, what the future and what type of um, tools we might be using and what is the best way to present uh, different things that we are trying to, to talk about. Um, and, and this I can just skip quickly because this is just more on a local basis, but the way we also involve with people is via different events, uh, public programs, debates, lectures. Uh, right now we have a, a series that is actually online series. It's a part of the conference on the future of Europe and it's called Envisioning Europe when we invited a lot of prominent historians, uh, political scientists, intellectuals to talk exactly about these big themes. Where are we as Europe now? What can we learn from history? What was already happening before? And just knowing that some, some of those things are nothing new. And, um, and what type of questions we can be now trying to solve together as, as Europeans. We have programming for families, which I thought it was interesting question that was posed here before. What parents can do in the education for children? Because again, 
uh, as informal educator, I strongly believe that um, the conversations happen everywhere, not only in schools and not only where children are. So it, those conversations can start very, very early. So we don't really shy from asking kids different questions when they come and in, involve them in different, again, what we call <laughs> European values or things that we're trying to talk about that they understand a little bit more what are their rights, what is voting about, why voting can be important, how voting can be used, how demonstrations and protests are important and how they've been used and how they've been used in the past. Um, and then we have different community outreach of working with different networks. Uh, one of the established ones is Europeana, Euroclio, eTwinnings. So these are large networks that help us to, to reach also teachers in other countries uh, with the resources that we try to disseminate. Um, currently, after COVID, like many other museums and probably institutions, we got to the point that, um, in a sort, we know what we're doing, <laughs> but not really, because uh, we want to reach the whole continent and we want to reach all Europe, but in the same time, we wanted to do it in an authentic and kind of constructive way. So uh, I think one of the points that we're to, uh, thinking about now, who our online community should be, with whom should we be engaging, through what platforms, and uh, we did have this question here posed again, how we can engage with youth, and what we see from our research and surveys that we do, we see that uh, our young visitors, we have a very high percentage of, of uh, young professionals, as we call them, 25 until 35, they are very invested in European issues, uh, but they are not always interested in getting engaged politically. So they are using different digital platforms, so we're now trying to see where they are, what those platforms are, but we really see them more as tools that we have to meet people than just something that we have to have it because right now it, it should be Facebook or Instagram or something. So again, we're really trying to have practical approach how we can work that, uh, further with our communities. So I think my time is up, so. <laughs> Very much, let's give her a big round of applause. Eva Goodman, <laughs> stay you. up here for a second. Yes. I like the fact that a museum is not just sort of uh, seeing things these days, but you can actually get to do things. It's interactive. I like the development of how that is taking place, and it seems like there's a lot of doing there as well. Um, let's talk about the field trip, um, because it, it, it's, it's going to be fun for a lot of people, everyone here, but especially for the people who are watching us online, because it's going to be an online field trip. Mm -hmm. What is going to be happening tomorrow? Tomorrow, that's right. So we're one of those field trips that actually do not compete with the physical field trips because our field trip will, uh, or workshop will happen online. That's mainly because of the restrictions that we're still under. We're waiting for the decision of the European uh, Parliament's president to open up our museum and uh, Parliament's uh, facilities to visitors and groups. You can still come and visit us in person as an individual, just booking is required. For, so for those of you who have more time in Brussels, I, I warmly invite you to come and see us. But for those of you who are watching us online, two of my colleagues from the learning team will be showing you a workshop when we present uh, one of our topics, so the history yeah. of European integration with the methodology and approach that I was trying to describe, how we do it from transnational perspectives, non-national perspective, and uh, basically how this can be used by in classroom settings, by teachers, by educators, and um, vocational schools, anybody who is working with this type of subject. Okay, well we have a satellite event from people watching in Azerbaijan, so that you might have a big delegation from Azerbaijan in your workshop there tomorrow, we're gonna see. Let's give her a big round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, Eva Goodman, thank you so much. All right, this has been the second window to Brussels. Again, I want to remind everyone that all of these organizations have field trips tomorrow, and you can sign up for them at the registration desk. There is a final part of today's session, two final parts, I should say, and for, to guide you through that, Yolanda is back for uh, the final, uh, a little bit more than an hour left of the first day. Yeah, thank you so much um, from my side as well to all the organizations, and we're very much looking forward to these field trips, both hybrid, the virtual ones, and the real ones. Um, and now it is with great honor that I ask you to join me in welcoming the director of the German Federal Agency for Civic Education. Welcome, Mr. Thomas Krüger.
Dear friends, a very warm and happy welcome to our NISI conference 2021. In Brussels, the city where European politics are hosted and debates on the future of, of Europe are alive. What better place to reconnect with our NISI community after these trying times? It is wonderful to see you back in person, both new faces and a lot of well-known NISI friends and colleagues here at the Atelier des Teneurs in Brussels. I would also like to extend my heartfelt thanks to our NISI partners on location here in Brussels and Lovens of the Bellevue Museum. As I have uh, heard, uh, there were already some exciting and fruitful discussions on this first day of the conference. Before we continue with uh, what, we, what will surely by the next uh, highlight of the event, I would like to give a short outlook of the future of NISI. We have long recognized the challenges and the associated importance of civic education at the European level. Since 2004, the BPB has been instrumental in supporting NISI activities, both financially and through STRAF. This project that was started by my colleague Petra Grüne, continued by Christoph Müller-Hofstede and now by Fatih Demircan, is very close to our hearts and has been given visibility very successfully in many European countries through our partners in Poland, in Czech Republic, Slovenia, Austria, the Netherlands, and lately also with our friends in Luxembourg and Belgium. But like many pilot projects or models, one day they learned to stand on their own two feet. They demand more independence and responsibility. This is also the case with NISI. This process of change has become very clear to me during the last few months, not least through a survey we did among the partners and advisory board members. I have always deeply appreciated and supported the special relevance of NISI to the work we do. It is therefore very important to me personally that the project has a sustainable future also after my time in office. To be absolutely clear, we will not withdraw from NISI. On the contrary, we will continue to support NISI financially and with our expertise. But it will be a new NISI. Still this year, we will begin a process of structural and organizational reorientation of NISI in order to give this initiative and platform an independent perspective from 2022 onwards to the make it attractive for additional European funders. A competition will call for ideas on how NISI should operate and be managed, guided in the future by an agile pan-European network, NISI headquarters. Apart from coordinating, the use of funding and organizing program elements. Headquarters will also set thematic priorities to develop NISI beyond the current status quo. This will include micro-grants, for example, to mark a new collaborative and social approach. There will be a competition for creative ideas for forms of cooperation and bottom-up formats that help to further develop European civic education. The new headquarters will not just be the managing office, but also contribute curatorial expertise and the conceptual and organizational design of new NISI. A cooperation agreement will give the office the necessary space to act and make decisions on a par with our supporters and partners. The decision on the ideas submitted will be made by a jury comprising, in addition to the BPB, other potential funders. This development process will also actively include the expertise of our existing partners and advisory board members. At this point, I'd like to thank all our partners and advisory board members 
many of whom are present here at the conference for their long years of trusting cooperation. So stay us at NISI. We will communicate this reorientation transparently and clearly. I'm sure that this new path will make NISI fit for the future and land civic education in Europe sustainable agency, especially in these times of change. But now is, it is my pleasure to announce the next item on the agenda, and this is a particular honor for me. When we talk about Europe, we can think of many attributes. Europe is a unique construct, a peace project and a community of shared values based on democracy and human rights. At the same time, it carries a heritage that still resonates today. In the talk that now follows a critical conversation about Europe, the eminent thinker, curator, and artist Bonaventure Sobejeng Ndikung will talk about his work to resolve the singularity of knowledge in favor of a plurality of epistemologies. Methodologically, this requires three approaches, deconstructing, decolonizing, and decolonizing which are mirrored in his, in his intellectual work as a thinker, curator, but also in his work as an artist. The Savi contemporary in Berlin, Germany, which has been strongly shaped by Bonaventure for years, is an important center of multiplicity. It offers the mental and physical space to think about the past, present, and future of democracy and society, art and culture, and to do so critically and from multiple perspectives. It is this kind of space that should ideally also be created by citizenship education, which is why it is perfectly at home here at the NISI 2021 conference at the heart of Europe. Thank you, Bonaventure, for enriching our conference. I'd like to welcome you also on behalf of the Federal Agency for Civic Education in Germany and look forward to a fascinating conversation between you and your moderator, Yolanda Rote. I wish all of us an interesting and enriching conference. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. All right. you go. You can take a seat right here. Thank you so much for this fantastic intro, uh, Mr. Kruger, and um, welcome also from me. It's great to have you here, Bonaventure. Um, you arrived today from Berlin, and I know that your schedule must be pretty packed, so it's really, really fantastic to have you here with us in Brussels. And I think let's give one more warm round of applause for the start of this conversation. So our conversation is entitled A Critical Conversation About Europe. Um, and I would say let's start right away with the European value system. The European value system is grounded in democracy and human rights, um, as well as in peace. Um, I believe we'd all be curious to understand which aspects you think are just as equally important to mention. First of all, good afternoon, good evening to you, and thank you very much for the invitation. I am very, very grateful to be here, very much appreciate the invitation, and thanks to Thomas for the very kind words. I have known Thomas for several years in Berlin, and to very much appreciate the support and, uh, from the BPB. And um, without institutions like the BPB, SAVI wouldn't have been possible. So I very much appreciate that and I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. um, I think the values you just mentioned um, are the key values, right? So human rights, you know, 
standing for a certain um, political bearing that ideally, you know, we'll get to that in a bit, should um, support people of different origins, genders, histories, and, um, and we've seen that especially um, during the last year um, in which the world has been forced to its knees um, because of a pandemic and we do see how uh, the values in Europe and the European countries have helped, you know, people to get back on their feet. That said, it is also important for us not to just celebrate ourselves, but also look critically at, you know, things that go wrong with the idea of a betterment. What does one need to do to ameliorate, even if things are good, we could always get better. So I think that is um, where our conversation should head to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know we're gonna dig into the value system perhaps even a little bit further. Um, I would like to pick up a quote um, from a German-Iranian writer and orientalist by the name of Navid Kermani. They state that, if we truly want to comprehend the value of the European construct or the European project, we must head to where it ends. Now the question to you, Bonaventure, would be where do you say we need to travel to, both on an epi epistemological or a local um, level, to understand the implications that this quote is referring to? Kemani is a great thinker, <laughs> and I do think he's um, very right, but I would even say we need to go even further than that. Mm -hmm. So, the question is, what does, or who does Europe see when they look into the mirror? I think that's an important question. Who do they actually see? So, of course, we need to go to the frontiers. We have to go beyond the frontiers. So all these values we mentioned, human rights, you know, a certain stable political bearing, those are all important. But those of you who, like me, are interested in the news and you read about the pushbacks in different European countries from Greece to the Balkan countries, you know that um, some people are more equal than others. Which is to say, if we're really thinking of human values and human rights, we need to consider the human rights of everybody. Not some that are paler than others, and not those that are dark and that blue. So the question is, how do we actually, and there have been thousands of people that have actually died in these pushbacks, you know. This is something we don't talk enough about, you know, but thousands of people actually, you know, and we need to think about their rights. Mm. But again, <clears throat> we can sit here and praise um, all the brilliant values of, the, of, the, of Europe. At the same time, um, if you look like a place like Cameroon, mm. um, and some of you know that in the past four years there's been a war in the country, and over 6,000 people have been killed, civilians. But the country is still doing business with a lot of European countries. 
So how do we talk about political values and human values mm. and at the same time do business with this kind of people? Mm. How do we reconcile that? And I think um, it's very important not to have double standards, otherwise people won't believe in this anymore, right? So we can't criticize... Um, <laughs> I mean, I'll give a very simple example, because we are here. A few weeks ago, we all know what happened in Chad. <laughs> Idris Deby, who's been in power since the 90s, and we know how he stayed in power. But he was killed. And one of the people that actually was there to put in place not a democratically elected person, but the son of Idris Deby was Macron. So how do we talk about democratic structures and at the same time support such structures? So it is in this space, this gray zone, that is no longer so gray, but actually darker than gray, mm. that we need to talk about Europe. Mm. So Europe, as we know, is an important structure, an important geopolitical construct, but it's only as good as the others in the world. Because at the end of the day, the question should be, how do we live together in this world? Mm. Especially at a time when we do know that Gone are the days where, you know, you could do something, you could destroy the Amazonas, and you think it just stays there, or you could dump waste in Cote d'Ivoire, mm. and it just stays there. We know that if you sell weapons to people in the Middle East, at some point, Come rain, come shine, they would come. <laughs> they would walk, they would swim, and they'll get here. So the world has become smaller. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for those insights. Um, I think they're very helpful in order to really put this into a global um, context and also into the dynamics that so very much still exist today. Um, even though the European Union was um, devised in a post-colonial era, there still is somewhat of an afterlife um, of coloniality in there that I think you're also you know, referring to in a way, and I think we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, perhaps to stay on this one point, um, where one could also head is, of course, the UK, two and a half hours away from here uh, with the Eurostar. And there's been, um, you know, an exiting of this country in the European Union, of the European Union. Um, and, of course, there's many layers here to understand um, to what regard, um, you know, has this been due to a national desire, an imperialistic desire. Um, and yeah, there's um, a lot to consider. I don't know if you want to respond perhaps to this. I mean, it, it's, it's something a, a lot of us do not like to talk about, you know, uh, the Brexit. But um, as you and I know, um, that there's been a longing for the empire. So, um, <laughs> the idea of the common world that is nothing, <laughs> which has nothing common about it, the uncommon world, um, which we can agree is a mischance um, for the citizens mm. of the UK. Um, what is for sure is that 
as we see, it's making life quite difficult for them. But the wish to get back into a structure in which the British profit from the former colonies. I hope we don't get back into that. But it is, as some say, I cannot say for certain because I don't know, that that has been the driving force behind it. Um, what I can say is that we just did an exhibition in, in the Netherlands, uh, in Arnhem, you know, Sonspec, which is a historically very important exhibition founded in 1949, uh, and uh, as a, a post-war gesture, and um, it was quite a torture to work with the artists based in the UK, you know. And at some point, we're almost you know, at the point of keeping them out mm. of the exhibition. But is that where Europe should be heading to? Mm. I think we agree it's not really the direction, mm. you know. Um, we should be thinking together rather than separating mm -hmm. ourselves. You know, and I think, um, yeah, yeah. So let's comment to that. Yeah. All right. Um, I would like to ask you about this concept of the singularity of knowledge, mm -hmm. um, epistemicide. Um, tell us perhaps what exactly it is that you mean by that. No, it's not really me meaning anything. It's, it's Boaventura de Souza Santos who, mm -hmm. who, who proposed that, you know, and, and many others before him. And uh, 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 M. Cesar also wrote that in the uh, uh, Discourse on Colonization, you know, the purposeful destruction of knowledges in the colonies, right? It's not uh, paraza, you know, the, 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 the domination that uh, the, the taking over, the claiming of land and peoples also meant the destruction of certain knowledge systems, mm -hmm. you know, the imposition of, you know, European knowledge structures to the rest of the world. I just did an interview with uh, Maria Teresa Alves yesterday, brilliant artist, Brazilian artist. And she was talking about the work she's been doing in Brazil with the indigenous people. And um, not only, you know, have they been disenfranchised, you know, physically, economically, but also in terms of their knowledge systems. Mm. So, not having the right to study your own language, not in school and not nowhere else, uh, not even having, it's only in 1988 or so that you could name a kid and give it an indigenous name. So you didn't even have the right to do that. So this is it. That, those are examples of the epistemicide. Mm. So guess what? Imagine you grew up in a place, and I think in the context of COVID, we've, we've seen that, in a place like Cameroon, um, in the middle of the crisis, uh, people started looking for alternative medical structures, like, okay, we know the hospitals won't heal us, <laughs> you know, so what else can we take? Mm. And they started looking at, you know, knowledge that had been passed down from generation to, the, to generation. And some of them could find something, but a huge part of them couldn't find anything because a lot has been lost. And how is it lost? Because it sounds so, so simple, you say, oh, but how can you lose that knowledge? You know, a simple thing is naming. Hmm. You know, so if you do not know how the plants are called in your own language. I went to school in a place where I couldn't, I wasn't, you weren't allowed to speak your language. Hmm. You, you were supposed to speak English or French. Full stop, in a country in which you speak 250 different languages. Right? 
So you lose your bearing, basically. So basically what we've been trying to do is to say, there's more than that. We must go in multiple directions. I mean, there's no way to, to undo what has been done, right? So I, I, do, I will have to speak English, German, French, and whatever is out there. But we have to learn certain languages. Mm. We have to find, that's why we say another knowledge is possible. Mm. Okay. Right? There must be other political structures, you know, governmental structures, civic structures. There must be that. Mm -hmm. And even the notion of democracy has to be context specific. There's no way, and we see that in Afghanistan, we see that in other places, there's no way you can take a political structure and impose on the people. There's no way. So we have to situate it. Mm -hmm. It has to um, fit the culture. And of course, there are limitations in a lot of cultures, like the limitations in the cultures here as well. Mm. But it has to be contextualized. So um, as somebody running an art space, um, that sees itself as an educational space, mm -hmm. that sees itself as um, a community center. We must acknowledge the multiplicity of beings that exist in that community and embrace the different knowledges they bring with them. Mm -hmm. Right? All right. Um, to follow up on this, mm -hmm. um, how does citizenship education become an answer to a singularity of knowledge? You just gave an example, thank you, with um, Savvy Contemporary providing this space for education. Um, but I would like to understand in the larger context how you see that this provides an answer to a plurality, a multiplicity of knowledge. <laughs> I mean, I'll have to, to talk about the whole curriculum vitae of, 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 of Savvy Contemporary to answer that question. Okay. But I'll put it, I'll, I'll try to do it in a very simple way. In 2012, I was having a conversation with a, with a, a, a local politician in Berlin, and he asked me, uh, where, where do you come from? And I, I said, well, I was born in Cameroon. And he said, oh, a French colony. <laughs> in my desperation, I said, oh, a German colony. And he, he responded this way. <laughs> Just for a very short time. <laughs> And um, in, in, the sh in my shock, the question was, what do you do? So we set up a project called Colonial Neighbors because of that, hmm. in which we wanted to, because Berlin is an interesting place, just like <laughs> Brussels. Um, the colonial history is omnipresent. The question is if you want to see it. It's as simple as that. So we started <laughs> just identifying, you know, to say that if this rather educated person, a politician doesn't know this, mm -hmm. then what about the others? Mm. So what we did was to do a campaign, a call for people just to look in their immediate environment. <laughs> Do you find anything that says something about German colonial history? Mm. And we were flooded with photo albums, stamps, whatever. Now, we know the one about street names. So the question is, what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. So just two days ago, we had 
a, a class come by at Savi, and they do, you know, exercises, workshops, in which somebody just ask them basic questions. I mean, few university students even know that <laughs> the partitioning of the African continent happened in Berlin. So, so these are simple things, you know. So to say that there is much more out there. Mm. Across the street, there is a plaza <laughs> called Nettelbeck Platz. Mm -hmm. And there's nowhere, it's not labeled anywhere, nothing, you know, that says who Nettelbeck was. Nobody. It's there. Right. So the question is, an important part is just to make people understand where they stand, where they are. You wouldn't even need to go too far. Right? So, we try to get money to do projects, discussive formats, workshops, invite artists, invite activists to think about these things, you know, to say, Nettelbeck might have won a war somewhere, mm -hmm. but he was also very much involved in the enslavement of people, buying people in West Africa and taking them to the Caribbean. Mm. And that in his lifetime, he even wrote a book about it. It's not, it's, it's not even something that you need to search too far to find. Mm. <laughs> right? So that is it. So it's omnipresent, but you just have to want to see it, mm -hmm. right? That is one, one aspect, but there are many other things, right? So uh, we're interested in the curriculum. So a lot of us teach in universities, you know, so we're interested in, you know, what is understood as philosophy, you know, what is understood as cultural studies, what, our, what are our references, you know, the politics of referencing, who do you reference when you actually teach? Mm -hmm. Right? So we're interested in that. We're interested in complicating references. Mm. You know. But also in questioning what does it mean to be a citizen? Mm -hmm. Right? We're talking about citizenship here. You know, we can talk about it from morning to evening. But I know that a few weeks ago, many friends of mine that have been living in Berlin for more than 10 years, paying their taxes and everything, didn't have the right to vote. Mm. So when we talk about citizens, do we imply them as well? Hmm. Yeah. What role do they play in the society? So all these things. Yeah, yeah and that brings me straight to uh, my next question around one, decanonization of knowledge, mm. but also decolonization in general. Perhaps we start with the more general. What do you say um, in more concrete terms where do you see areas where decolonization can happen, is needed, perhaps cannot even happen? What is your take on this? I don't know. You know, it's, uh, the one, one, one thing we should be careful about is that, um, you know, as Catherine Walsh and, and uh, Walter Mignot mm -hmm. write in, in their book, there's a chapter called uh, The Adjectival lightness of, of decoloniality. Mm -hmm. We should be careful that the adjective of lightness. Mm -hmm. We should be careful that decolonization and decoloniality shouldn't mean everything and nothing. Mm -hmm. It is a project. So, um, which demands change. Mm -hmm. A change in the way uh, people are treated. We talked about human rights a change in economic relations, you know. Uh, next year, we'll actually do a book in relation, uh, uh, um, an exhibition in relation to a book that was written in 1972 by Walter Rodney, which is a fundamental piece of political writing with the title, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Mm -hmm. And it is a book on decolonization. Okay. So... I would need to give a thesis on the book to answer your question. But to say that, it starts with the relations between people and nations. Mm -hmm. It starts with the understanding of what we mean by 
liberté, mm-hmm. égalité, mm-hmm. fraternité. Mm. Who is actually in liberty? What brotherhood are we talking about? And who is equal? Mm. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you bring in um, these three values, this set of values, um, because there is um, a, an article I saw, um, I think it was yesterday, called Le Grand Continent. And it basically speaks about um, the narrative that Europe is seeking um, to have and how its coloniality doesn't really um, play too much of a big role in there. And that's why these three terms that are so known to everyone, um, really asking the question, who do they actually apply to? Who has the privilege of that actually? Exactly. Um, that, that, is, that is the point. And it's, it's important to, to mention this, you know, because um, actually, you know, the, the, the Latin American thinkers that, uh, that work with the notion of coloniality, what is important is, is, is the continuum of it. You know, when Anibaki Kano talks about the coloniality of power, mm-hmm. what it actually means is the continuum of these power structures that were set in place mm. during the colonial enterprise and how the f- found forms, you know, um, to, to continue mm. reigning in different societies today, right? Um, yeah, and, and the way they impact people. Mm. So um, we see that in different societies, you know. We can, we can think of, of uh, Libya, you know, where, where is Libya today after the killing of Muammar Gaddafi, mm. you know. I'm talking about this because I was just following, uh, you know, the, the case of Thomas Sankara went to court finally, you know, um, after uh, over, you know, three decades, you know, to finally find out who killed him, you know. We know where Burkina Faso is mm-hmm. today, you know, because the possibility of creating a democratic structure was destroyed before it even germinated. Mm-hmm. And it is not the first time, right? So, as Nkrumah wrote in, in, uh, in um, his book on uh, neocolonialism, mm-hmm. he said, the, the last phase of imperialism is neocolonialism. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's very insightful, and I feel like... Um, yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, what you had just said. Um, I would like to go to the point of decanonization and hear your thoughts um, on what you think a decanonization of knowledge um, implies, what it involves, um, and also how this connects to, again, the topic of citizenship education. I think I've answered the question already uh, in different ways. Indeed. Right? Uh, Because it's it's about questioning the canon. Mm -hmm. It's about Mm -hmm. questioning the necessity of a canon. It's about questioning who is in the canon. It's about making the canon more porous. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, creating space for others, Mm -hmm. you know, for other beings, Mm. you know. It's about leadership, you know. How many women do we have in in leadership positions Mm -hmm. in our societies, Mm -hmm. you know. It's about looking at, you know, what happened in Italy uh, yesterday Mm. in which uh, a bill that would have protected the rights of LGBTQ people, you know, was just uh, um, smashed, Mm -hmm. you know. So it's about all that. Mm -hmm. It's about questioning normativity. So if you say questioning normativity, does that involve a deconstruction? And it, would that be a starting point to do this, or are yes, we adding on? Yes, definitely. Okay. And would you say that this is already in motion in some places? 
I think the, the fact that we sit here and talk about this says that it's in motion. Mm -hmm. You and know, there's no, there's no turning back. And I mean, we, we see that there are efforts in places, you know, it, look at what is happening in Poland, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, mm -hmm. uh, you know to, to, to go backwards. But I think, you know, again, Europe would only be strong if it can, if such efforts have consequences. Mm. Okay. Right? So um, it, it's impossible for us to imagine a society in which people do not have right, you know, just because they do not fit to your understanding of what sexuality is. Mm. I mean... Okay, so um, you've brought in another um, point here, which is the topic of consequences and accountability. You want to take us a little bit on this track? No. <laughs> I want to know, what do you deem <laughs> is the right sense of consequence and the right or what does accountability look like? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I, I mean, I think this is... What I know is that um, you, you, you cannot reward people... <laughs> I mean, you cannot set a set of values mm. and people stand against it and you reward them for that. So, I mean... You could also put a whole set of values, and if people, if you're not, if people are not holding to it, and there's no accountability, then why should they hold on to it? Mm, mm. Then even more would do it. So, but you know, that's not my, mm -hmm. not my field. Mm. <laughs> you know, I I would leave that to others. <laughs> Speaking of others. Um, we do have the possibility for you to ask questions. Um, for everyone who's tuning in, feel free to um, put in a comment, a question on the Slido. Um, and for everybody here in the room, we will be opening up the floor shortly. So um, I'm looking forward to having uh, an interactive discussion in just a moment. Um, but thank you for all these thoughts. I think it's very, very interesting, inspiring, triggering. Um, and I want to take um, us down one more um, avenue. We've talked about it already, but just the ambiguity and the plurality that we have here in Europe. And nonetheless, the faces that Europe is usually associated with are probably not necessarily individuals like you and myself. Um, we see nationalism, a rise in authoritarianism, right wing um, and ra racism, and so the question is, what do you see as the biggest challenge here? Why is there this rise when we actually have a pluriversality, to quote Mignolo? I was just talking to Fatih about that earlier. <laughs> um, I have to choose my words, right? <laughs> Again, that longing for something that doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. The idea of the phantom limb. So, you might actually feel a scratch, mm -hmm. although you don't have a leg. So there's something, there's an incredible longing and a refusal to accept um, that the demographics are different. And actually, and that is the question, when Europe looks itself in the mirror, what does it actually see? Mm -hmm. Or who does it actually see? Mm -hmm. I think that's important. And all the efforts to erase certain peoples shall fail because we know that when things were really bad during COVID, we know the kind of people 
that were actually manning the hospitals as nurses mm -hmm. in different parts of Europe. We know the people. There was a reason why a certain kind of people were dying because they were the ones working in the front line. Mm. So I cannot really explain why there is this shift and this radicalization towards the right uh, besides saying that there's this incredible romantic longing for something that doesn't really exist, mm -hmm. you know. Now, the question would then become, how do we actually deal with this? Mm -hmm. The method I have chosen, mm -hmm. and many others, and I think people like Thomas, mm -hmm. and many of us, is to find other ways so music, for example, mm. jazz. Mm -hmm. But yesterday, I did a class with my students, mm -hmm. and we're thinking of something that is considered the, almost a national music of Spain, which is flamenco. Mm -hmm. And I love flamenco. And I love the history of flamenco. And if you understand flamenco and the history of flamenco, you would understand that Spain, like any other European country, is a very complicated space. There is no way you can reduce it to some singular, you know, banal structure. Mm -hmm. It is actually this multiplicity that informs the nation, mm. right? It is the, the music and the being and the knowledge of the Arabs, of the Africans, mm -hmm. you know, of the Sinti and Roma people, and so on. You know, when Locker writes about the Duende, we remember the speech Locker gave in 1933 in Argentina mm. about the Duende as a soul, you know, of the Spanish people. Mm. Of course, what he's talking about is the different beings mm -hmm. that actually make Spain whether they like it or not. You might not want to accept it, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we don't need to debate whether these places are actually migrant societies or not. Mm. You know, they what they are, you know, and all efforts to define them as something other than that will fail. Plus, we know that a lot of European societies are what they are today even economically, because of the others. Mm. <laughs> we know that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for all of this. Um, I think we can head into the Q&A um, part of the conversation. And I already see a few questions via Slido. Um, and I do open the floor um, to all of you here in the room. Let's start with one of the questions that has reached us um, on Slido. And the question is, how do we manage to go from praising the values of Europe to actually living them? Great question. Very good question. How do we actually do that? <laughs> now, um, The question actually is, where do we find the values mm -hmm. of you? Mm -hmm. What do we actually talk about when we talk about these values of Europe? How do we shift from the institutionalization of these values, or these values existing only within certain institutions, to having them within the communities, right? We can talk about these things, we can sit here and talk about them, mm -hmm. but how are they actually lived there? So one way, in my opinion, <laughs> the values are lived when 
we do not work with double standards. Mm -hmm. And we actually create a society that is livable mm -hmm. for the people that make up that society, not only the people that have a citizenship of a certain place, mm. but also that we know that we are dependent on each other. When we go beyond the, the discourse of developed versus underdeveloped, that it is a certain group of people that know what it means to be developed and the rest is underdeveloped. Mm. You know, when we go beyond these discourses of aid, but actually think of a codependency and interdependency, mm. that is how we leave mm -hmm. the values, mm -hmm. right? That the guy who goes up and down the street of Neukölln on his bike, whistling, and I've seen him do that for 10 years on because he doesn't have the right to vote. I know who you mean. Yeah. That we actually give him the possibility of becoming part of a society mm. in which he pays his taxes. He must have the possibility of choosing the leader or the people that lead him in that society. Mm. That is how we make the values livable. Otherwise, people won't take the values not the people that proclaim these values seriously. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for this. Um, another question that has reached us is um, relating to the term citizenship education and in how far it is a hegemonial term in and of itself and how it can contribute nevertheless to more um, multi-perspective approaches. Mm. Hmm. If we consider that citizenship is already perhaps excluding. Yes, in that case, yeah. But if we, we talk of a citizenship that is inclusive, mm -hmm. you know, then it's no longer hegemonial. Okay. If we think of societies that are not built on exclusion, then it's no longer hegemonial. Yeah. I think that's a pretty straightforward answer. Right there. Fantastic. There's another question here on the European value system, but I would be curious. There's a question all the way in the back. I believe we have a roaming microphone. Perhaps it could reach all the way in the back. It would be great if you could introduce yourself with your name. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. This was a very interesting conversation. Uh, my name is Luisa Slavkova, coming from Bulgaria, and I have two questions. The one is, going back to your example, meeting the Berlin local politician who made that comment to you. So in the formats you do at the SAFI, the workshops you talked about, how do you reach out to people like him? So how do you integrate them in your work so that they potentially would change also their opinion? And the second question is, how, how do you talk to people who are afraid of left-wing extremism? Thank you. How do we reach people like the politician, you mean? Well, it's, it's very easy to reach those people because we are an institution in which the, in, we invite people like that to come and to come. So they're actually not the priority, if I may say. Because, I mean, he, he was there for the conversation. That's why we talked about it. So, mm. I mean, the question, the more difficult one, is how do we actually reach, you know, say the students and the schools and so on and so forth. I think that's a more complicated one. To me, it's also a generational question. You know, where do we put the emphasis? I would like to put my emphasis on, you know, a younger generation. Of course we do things for different, you know, groups of people, age groups. But I would like to think of those that are, you know, actually have the future in their hands. 
So that, I, I hope that answers the question. But we use different formats, you know. One of the things we, we've, we've been doing in the past years, like when, uh, you know, one of the first things I did when I was invited to join the team of, the curatorial team of Documenta 14 was to use the radio as a format, as a medium. So we use that, we do a lot of radio, you know, so reaching out to people that might not necessarily come to the space physically. So we do that. So we do, uh, and we do a lot of processions. We do a lot of interventions in public spaces, you know. Uh, but we also reach out to, yeah, you know, such institutions. We know we host meetings of different parties <laughs> at Savi. We invite them to come by. We show them the work we do. We have to do that. But again, that's not the most difficult part, really. Then the second part, of, the second question, I don't know if I understood it properly. People that are afraid of left-wing extremism. I mean, what should I say about people that are afraid of left-wing extremism? I mean, I, I, I don't think we need any form of extremism. But I'm also very um, skeptical about, you know, putting all forms of extremism in one pot. But I'm very, I, 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 I don't like any form of extremism. I don't know. I don't know if it answers your question, but... Um, yeah, I think we can do things without being extremists. I think there was one more question um, in the audience. I do have another question for you, though. We, oh, you're still I'm, on it. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> if we take the yes. Mm -hmm. Put up your hand. Yep. Two questions. Two questions. Please stand up and say your name. Hello, my name is Max, and I was wondering, human rights are a universal value, meaning they don't just belong to Europeans, they don't just apply to Europeans, but to people all around the world. But how does Europe, or the EU rather, that we're talking about, protect the human rights of people in Cameroon, in China, in other countries, while still respecting their sover uh, sovereignty and laws that have been made, for example, by the UN, or something similar to laws. How do we help the people go there and enforce human rights? That's a, a very good question. Um, the questions as to the how are very difficult to answer because, you know, one of the things that one could possibly do is to, I mean, if we set the standard, again, we're talking about consequences earlier. If we say that we believe that human rights are equal all over the world, and we truly believe in that, then it is baffling to think that uh, European countries would be doing again, business or entertaining political relationships with a president that has been in power since 1982, that has been kept in power, not only is just in power, has been kept in power again. I mean, you all know about the notion of the France Africa. It's nothing I need to explain to you. Um, and that it is exactly this that makes the imbalance in the understanding of people actually believing that their humanity is the same as the humanity of, of the others in Europe. So how can that actually, how can one support? It is holding your governments accountable It is holding the government accountable. 
It is saying that, I mean, we have to, it, it's as simple as that. We have to watch, you know, who is selling weapons and where do the weapons go to? And how are the weapons used? We cannot play ignorant with that. We cannot say that, you know, it doesn't matter what is done with them. Weapons are not used for decoration. And if you send weapons to a country <laughs> that has had a president for over 40 years, in which there's a war, I mean, you cannot be, I mean, I, I, sorry, I don't know what to say. So you, we, we must hold the governments accountable. Now, please don't ask me, how do you do that? Hello, my name is Herman. I think my question follows up quite nicely because accountability um, is a term where you previously said this is not your field. Now you are bringing it in as an idea. And I'm wondering, I, I would like to understand the concept of decolonization better and use the um, quote by um, Namani um, that in order to understand something, you have to look how it ends. So I'm wondering in order to understand decolonization better, I would want also to understand how it ends. So when you have deconstructed, for instance, normativity, then there is no way to hold someone accountable anymore. So this decolonization, deconstructing of normativity, saying accountability is not your field anymore, I do not see where it ends, if not in an empty space where everyone is not accountable for anything anymore, and what do we have then? So I'm a little bit lost, sorry. Well, I think you can be lost if you want to be lost. Um, but I think, uh, you know, to think of a multiplicity of society and to, to, to go beyond you know, a singular narrative doesn't mean that you cannot, that people cannot be accountable. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes without saying, you know, so if, if, you, if you say that there are 12 different people, 20 different people in this space, those people could still come together and choose somebody to lead them. And that person that leads them can actually be accountable. I mean, it doesn't, the one doesn't negate the other. I don't see where your problem is, actually. So, um, and if you say that uh, decolonia decolonization and decoloniality would actually mean creating better relations with people that are not based on extractivism, and not based on exploitation, as it has been the case for more than 400 years, then you cannot say that it's taking you to an empty space. Because that's exactly what people, people do not want to be the machine, you know, working for less than a euro, one euro to make t-shirts that will be sold expensively in Europe. That is what it actually means, you know. I was in Pakistan when uh, the factory burned down, you know, for which people were locked up. They were locked up because they were not even allowed to have a break to smoke. And they would open the door to, for them to have lunch and go back and continue working. And when the fire broke, they couldn't escape. Right? It's that. It's setting standards. It's saying that if you want the workers in Belgium to work under certain conditions, you must give that same condition to the people working in Pakistan. Uh -huh. What is so difficult to understand about that? Yeah. 
constructing normativity, but it's also about constructing norms, and you are building up normativity. And I think that's something that has to be said in addition. So in order not to lead decolonialization into an empty space. So it, it needs to be also clear that there will be a new normativity. It's not the end of normativity, and it's not the end of accountability also. That's only what, what I want. Nobody to says it should be the end of accountability. I mean, nobody says it. I mean, you know, there are norms. The problem is the imposition of certain norms on certain places. Okay. You say, you, you, could, you, could, you could actually say, yes, there, there are multiple norms, but that is a part of the, the construction of a singular norm. So you call it whatever you want, but the fact is that um, if we're human and we accept those values, we ac acknowledge our differences though, which is, I'm not saying that everything should be, no, we acknowledge those differences. Uh, we, we do say um, we need to treat people as humans then in different places. I, I, I miss the impasse in that. That's um, a common understanding also from all world religions that norms need to be argued for and that there need to be a process to create the norms. And then the question is how to integrate people into the creation of norms. Civic society. We are approaching the end of this conversation. I do think that there were still some questions in the audience, but I would suggest that we take those um, into the reception and continue the conversation there. Do you have one more question? I did have one more question. I have quite a few questions. There's perhaps one thought that I had about this accountability that I may share as perhaps a leaving thought, um, and that is that in the work that I do with the foundation that I work for, Stiftung Zukunft Berlin, we talk very much about um, the ownership of every single citizen in Europe, and that we are co-creating this project Europe, um, and that we have to understand ourselves as the owners. And I feel like this is the key to achieving some form of accountability. Then that has to, of course, go higher into the institutions, perhaps, but the first key starts within each and every one of us. But that's why I think we even need to push it further. We are co-creating this world, Absolutely. not just Europe, with all due respect. And that's why I give the example, you know, if we're destroying, you know, the rainforest on the, on, on the African continent, it will have impact on Europe. So it doesn't matter how good you co-create Europe. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just what it is, you know. If you're driving from Douala to Yaoundé, you know, you see the number of trucks carrying, you know, trunk, tree trunks, heading out of the country, mm. you know. You question the future of the world. Mm. And we have to think on that level, you know, otherwise we sit here talking about environmental crisis day in, day out, and the co-creation of Europe won't help us in any way. We must think of the world in which we live in together. I couldn't have ended this conversation any better. Let's give a warm round of applause. Thank you so much, Bonaventure. Thank you. Right. Wow.
thank you so much. Wow, what a day it has been here in Brussels and to everyone tuning in, thank you so, so much for being a part of NISI 2021. This has been the first day. I'm gonna hand over to you to let us know what awaits us tomorrow. Lots of interactivity because we're gonna have a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of theoretical input today. Tomorrow we're gonna actually put it into practice. We have starting at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, five sessions on site here, one of which will be live streamed and we have six sessions online via Zoom and GatherTown. And all of those workshops are accessible. If you are registered, you can still do so at nisi.eu. Are there any uh, people who are uh, giving workshops here in this room today present? Yes, a couple of them are present. Yes, okay. Um, I, if, if you want to know more about their workshop, be sure to ask them. I think they're going to be a lot of fun. I think they're going to be engaging. I'm looking forward to them. Uh, um, so uh, we're going to have that starting at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, people. Is everyone sort of ready to get up slightly <laughs> early, perhaps? Of course, of course. <laughs> no, not yet. You need a good night's rest. I think that's totally fair and valid. Um, okay. Uh, Fatih, is there anything else you want us to mention here uh, today? Um, we're there, looking at our boss, ladies and gentlemen. The, so <laughs> is there anything we need, we need to mention now in this last part? There is Are you one satisfied? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going to actually... Hold on, hold on. You're satisfied? Okay, we're going, to say, we're going to have a slight cliffhanger here because we're going to say something interesting. There, be extra nice to him. I'm not going to tell you why. We're not going to tell you why. It is a, it is a complete secret, but at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, we're going to tell you. It's embarrassing if we tell it now, so we're not going to say it now. But at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, this is a cliffhanger. We're going to tell you why you should be extra nice to Fatih today. And again, we're only going to say it once, right? At 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, right? Okay, I'll listen to you. Okay, wonderful. On this one. Perhaps there's one more point that we want to express. Tomorrow from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., we are having another very interesting and intriguing conversation. It's a so-called fishbowl, and we'll be talking about citizenship education and EU policy. So really on the decision-making level and what a new beginning could look like. We have MEPs who are joining our conversation, so please make sure to tune in, come back for this conversation if you've been out and about. And um, as um, my co-host Victor already said, I guess there's a surprise announcement waiting there's for everyone tomorrow yes. at 9 a.m. I'm promising it here right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We're going to be heading over to the reception yes, now, which is... I'm not allowed to say it, but let's start drinking, folks. That's actually what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great.